Chairman. And I can hear and see you, Councillor Angus. Thank you. Councillor Bowen. I can see and hear you, Mr Chairman. And I can see and hear you. Thank you, Councillor Bowen. Councillor Durkin. I can see and hear you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. Councillor Fagan. I can see and hear you. Thank you. And I can see and hear you. Thank you, Councillor Fagan. Councillor Foxton. Not yet. Councillor Hunt. Good morning, Chairman. Pleasure to see you and hear you. And to you, Councillor Hunt. Thank you. Councillor James, we know he's uh, given his apologies. Councillor Johnson. Good morning, Chairman. I can hear and see you. And are you, Councillor Johnson? Thank you. Councillor Milmore. Good morning, Chairman. I can hear you. And I, I can see and hear you. Thank you, Councillor Milmore. Councillor Milne. He's having trouble getting in, Chairman. Yeah. Um, we, we, um, I can see him. Councillor Milne, can you see and hear me? I think he's muted. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're muted, Councillor Milne. Mm. Can I go I back? Can, uh, uh, no, see and hear you. Sorry, I, it was a struggle oh, getting... I'm... I'm Okay. I can see and hear you. Uh, Councillor Foxton, I can see that you have a, a arrived. Can I confirm that you can see and hear me? Thank you. I can see and hear you. Thank you. Councillor Stone. I can see and hear you, Mr Chairman. And I can see and hear you, Councillor Stone. Thank you. Councillor Tillett. Thank you, Chairman. I can see and hear you. And I can see and hear you. Thank you, Councillor Tillett. And finally, Councillor Watson. Uh, good morning, Chair. I can hear and see you. Thank you. And a good morning to you. I can see and hear you as well. Councillor Watson, thank you very much. Can I now ask uh, Mr Simon Withers, who's our lead officer today, to introduce the, uh, the team? Thank you, Councillor Selden. Yes, my name's Simon Withers. I'm the Development Manager. I'm deputising for Kevin Bishop, the Lead Development Manager today, and providing uh, planning advice and guidance to the committee. Um, also, can I introduce Dawn Evans, uh, the Legal Advisor to the Planning Committee today, uh, and also John Coleman and Tim Brown from the Governance team who are supporting the meeting in the background and providing minutes. Uh, I then need to introduce you to the case officers presenting today. Um, we have Dave Gossett, Senior Planning Officer, presenting on item six, the site in Cleonga. Charlotte Atkins, the Principal Planning Officer, item seven, the attenuation pond in Founhope. And then item eight, Elsie Morgan, the change of use application for the church in Brampton Abbots. Um, and finally, can I also make mention of uh, Mark Lewis, our area engineer team leader, who is on hand to provide any advice and guidance on highway matters if required. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Selden, we can't hear you. Thank you very much. I have just fallen into the classic Zoom trap of trying speaking to myself while muted. Deep breath. May I now request the public speakers for agenda item six, attending as virtual attendees. That's Alison Davis of Colonga Parish Council and Mr Hastings, a local resident objecting to the application are admitted to the meeting. Neither appear to be present in the waiting room at the moment, Chairman. OK, thank you, Mr Brown. Um, do we have written representations or other representations from them? Yes, from both. Yeah. yeah thank you. OK. Right. So off we go. Finally, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's meeting. The Council is video and audio streaming the meeting live on the internet and making an official recording. The recording forms a part of the public record of the meeting and will be available on the Council's website. 
Please note that it is a legal requirement that every member attending virtual meetings is able to hear and where practicable see and be heard and where practicable be seen by the other members in attendance and the public watching. So I ask you please that you have your audio switched on when you're able to do so, that you have your video also switched on. Please remember that what you say and do in this meeting has a global reach and your words and actions should be chosen carefully. Can I also remind members to ensure that they are wearing their headsets while listening and speaking during the meeting. This will ensure the audio quality is of the highest possible quality and background noise is significantly reduced. As these are extraordinary circumstances, there are additional points for members and officers to be aware of. As a part of the meeting etiquette and in line with our normal committee practices, all microphones apart from mine will be placed on mute at the start of the meeting. I will then run through the agenda in the customary way. When you wish to speak, please use the hand button against your name in the participants list, which you should see on the right of your screens. I will then invite you to speak. You may then unmute your microphones. Please do not raise your physical hands as I do not wish to miss anybody who may wish to speak. Please note that the chat facility has been switched off to ensure that members' contributions can be offered through the spoken voice and for the public record. Please ensure that all other mobile devices are switched off to prevent interference with the audio and video systems. Members are reminded that speeches are limited to three minutes. So I now move on to the public speaking arrangements. Please note that as part of the virtual meeting format, those registered to speak in accordance with the public speaking procedure, parish council, an objector and a supporter, are able to participate in the following ways, by making a written submission, by submitting an audio recording, by submitting a video recording, or by speaking as a virtual attendee. I will deal with these formats in the following way. For statements received by email, the legal advisor will read that statement out. For statements received by audio or video, the recording will be played live for the meeting. For virtual attendees of the public, I will invite them to speak in turn via the audio or video live during the meeting. So then I move on to uh, apologies for absence for this meeting. We have received apologies from councillors Polly Andrews, Councillor John Hardwick and Councillor Paul Roan and Councillor Terry James. We have the following substitute councillors, Councillor Bowen for Councillor Hardwick, Councillor Durkin for Councillor Roan and Councillor Tillett for Councillor Polly Andrews. Uh, then we now come on to declarations of interest. Please indicate by raising your virtual hand if you wish to declare an interest. I will then call upon each councillor in turn. So are there any declarations of interest from members for items on this agenda? I see none. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. There are no directors. Um, Chair, Councillor Watson's got a hand up. Oh, thank you. Um, Councillor Watson. Uh, sorry, Chair. I should just say that um, I know the, well, we all know the applicant for the second one with Found Hope um, because he's my group leader. And um, yeah, he's also, <laughs> so he's known to me. So I'm just wanting to declare that. Um, thank you, Councillor Watson. Um, Ms. Evans, is there a case for um, a, a, a a blanket um, dispensation for people who know Councillor Hardwick? They know him in the capacity that obviously he is their group leader. It's very much going to be the same for everybody across the board who is um, uh, an independent with them. As far as it goes, it would just be uh, noted on the minutes of the meeting that uh, it's a non-pecuniary interest on the basis that everybody knows him as their group leader. As long as there's nothing further <clears throat> involved that they know him of a more of a personal nature, which would to a reasonable man to be seen um, to be you see where I'm what I'm trying to say on this uh, on chair but um, that that would be just across the board I think the point you're making is that there, there is no prejudicial interest in, in considering this application by this council 
Is that the case? That's correct, yes. Thank you. Uh, I have two hands raised. Um, Councillor Milne, I believe. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. I, I have a I have to declare an interest in application number 200299 in, in uh, as I know, uh, Ms. Prothero, who is one of the objectors, uh, she's a member of my political party. Thank you, Councillor Milne. Um, we have, so, I can't, I can't actually, oh, Councillor Bowen. You're muted, Councillor Bowen. Can you hear me now? I hope so. I can hear you now. Good, thank you. Uh, I am in the same position as Councillor Watson, in that I know um, uh, Councillor Hardwick uh, thank fairly you. well, and he's a group leader as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I think all, all long-standing members of the council will know Councillor Hardwick as the chairman of this committee normally. Uh, I'm as vice chairman taking his place for today. Are there any other declarations of interest? I see none. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, can I move on then to the minutes of the last meeting? Uh, no matters of accuracy have been noted to the monitoring officer. The legal advisor will now ask each committee member in turn to indicate whether they are content with the minutes of the last meeting. Ms. Evans. Thank you, Chair. Um, as I was not in attendance at the last planning committee meeting, um, I will obviously have to read out the names of those who were or who were likely to have been there, who were long-standing members of the planning committee. Um, and obviously, if we get a response, we get a response. Um, if I can go in the order that I have before me, um, Councillor Graham Andrews. Not present yet. Thank you. Councillor Paul Andrews. Fine. OK with them. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Polly Andrews is obviously not not here. Uh, Councillor Fagan. Yes, I accept the minutes. Thank you. Councillor Foxton. Yes, in agreement. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, just for clarification, if you agree, then just say agree. Um, if you don't, then just say don't and the reasons why. Thank you. Councillor Stone. Agree. Councillor Hunt. Agree. Councillor Johnson. Agree. Councillor Milmore. Agree. Council. Sorry, if you missed that, I did say I agree. Sorry, yeah, you, thank you, Hunt. yeah, thank you, Councillor Hunt. Councillor James is, isn't here. Councillor Johnson, I believe we've just had. Yes. Correct, thank you. Councillor Milmore. Agree. Councillor Milne. Agree. Councillor Rome's not here. Councillor Selden. Agree. Councillor Watson. Agree. Have I covered everybody that's on the list? If I haven't, please say. I think you've got everybody that was present at that meeting. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Selden. That covers the minutes. Thank you very much. Um, the next item is Chairman's announcements. Um, you will all be aware that the Secretary of State is due to deliver his uh, paper on the revisions to the planning system um, tomorrow. Um, I don't think many people know exactly what's in that paper, apart from what's been, uh, what um, the Secretary of State's been saying around uh, Westminster and other places. So I would urge you all to have a good look at that when it's published finally tomorrow. Um, the impacts on Herefordshire Council and our, our planning systems and, and communities that we represent uh, leaves, means that we may well have to revise some of our processes. But I will leave it to you to read that. And I'm sure uh, when we come to the next meeting, uh, Mr Bishop and others will have plenty to say on those revisions. So that brings us on to item six, which is the first application between, before us. It is land adjacent to Garnham, Birch Hill, Clonga, Herefordshire. Proposed erection of two dwelling houses with shared physical access. Um, Mr Gossett. I believe this is yours. Um, excuse me, Chairman. Um, just one moment. Just one moment. I think that there might be uh, one of the speakers waiting to come in. Um, ah. do, you want, do you want me to admit them, John? Is that yes? Yeah. Yes, please, Tim. Yeah.
They're just coming in now. Who do we have? Um, it's, it's... Just to be clear, James Spreckley is a speaker on the, the next item. Yes, yeah. Yes. Um, I, th I, th I think this, hopefully, is this um, Alison Davies? Yeah. Oh, good morning, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, good morning. Are you all with? Excellent. Um, we've Chairman, just... it, might be, it might be interesting. I, I, I've just sent um, Alison uh, the link um, because I didn't know whether she wanted to be here. So it would be interesting to know whether Alison knew that she could participate by Zoom or whether it's my just sending her a note now, which has alerted her to it. No, I knew I could, David. I knew I could mm -hmm. contribute. Right. Okay. Uh, she was on the list, so I take it that the, uh, the, the committee staff have fulfilled their roles properly. And thank you for confirming that. Ms. Davis. Um, so, Mr. Gossett, we have you. It's your turn for presentation, please. Indeed. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> wait for that presentation to get started. Okay, good morning members and uh, thank you Chairman. Um, the application before the committee today is for full planning permission for the erection of two dwellings, one a detached bungalow, the other a detached two-story dwelling with separate garage. In the first instance, for reference, the proposal falls to be considered against the Herefordshire local plan core strategy, which forms the development plan today. Additionally relevant and material is the national planning policy framework and the emerging draft Klihonga Neighbourhood Development Plan. This document passed through Regulation 16 draft consultation and is currently undergoing independent examination. As a whole, it can be attributed moderate weight at this time. However, due to unresolved objections specific to this application site, policy C2, which defines the settlement boundary for Klihonga, can only be attributed limited weight. This has been confirmed by the Neighbourhood Planning Manager. The location of the site is marked on your slide by the usual red star. The site is a field located to the southeast of the dwelling known as Garnham. It is laid to grass with boundary hedges. Uh, Garnham forms the southeastern extremity of the village of Klihonga. Next slide, please. Here, the application site is marked by the red edge in the top map. Uh, the bottom aerial photograph shows the context and surrounding field pattern of the site, with the site approximately in the center of that shot. Next slide, please. This plan shows the site's relationship with the applicant's home at Garnham, marked by the blue edge. The application site lies between Garnham and the private access for Birch Hill House on the unregistered 73412 named Poplar Road, which runs southeast out of Klihonga. The site is outside but abutting the defined settlement boundary contained within the emerging CNDP in which Garnham is the last property recognized as forming part of that settlement. Policy C2, which defines the settlement boundary, can only be attributed limited weight, as already covered. Under RA2, the proposal is considered to be adjacent to the main form of the settlement. While the surrounding environment includes a number of cottages in indicated on the historic ma mapping, which dates back as far as 1843, there are no listed heritage assets in the vicinity of the site. Next slide, please. Members will see here the proposed site plan. To the right is the proposed two-storey detached dwelling with detached garage, and then to the left is the proposed bungalow. A single shared access is proposed between them onto Poplar Road, with a section of hedgerow needing to be removed to facilitate this access. Two further sections either side of this will be then translocated behind the required visibility space. The visibility space have been calculated following a seven-day speed survey and are 25.7 metres southbound, 26.8 metres northbound. These are secured via condition four on the recommended conditions. A range of landscaping is proposed, which will be covered later in detail. Um, the drainage uh, is to utilise soakways to manage excess surface water runoff. While the application was supported by soakway testing, further testing has been requested by the council's drainage consultant, which is secured via condition nine. In terms of foul drainage, this will be managed by individual package treatment plants with final outfall to on-site drainage field. No concern was raised here by the drainage consultant. Um, and on this matter, it is considered to be policy compliant. Next slide, please. 
Here members will see two photos from Poplar Road taken either side of the proposed access with the map at the top right indicating the location and direction of the photos with the corresponding color. The photo highlighted in red shows the view southeast from the proposed access. Sorry, southeast along the road with the proposed access to the left of that photo. And then the blue photo to the right shows the view northwest along Poplar Road. The access is proposed along the stretch of hedgerow to the right of the image beyond the hazard sign. Next slide, please. Here are photos from within the application site itself, again with the map in the top right indicating location and direction organized by color. Firstly, the red photo has taken, was taken near the shared boundary with Garnham, looking up the application site. It is possible to see the mature hedgerow surrounding the field. The green photo is towards the southern corner of the site and show, shows the location of an existing site access with a new fence and planting. The blue photo is the wider view north of the application site across Klehonga towards hills on the other side of the River Wye. Members should note this view as it is specifically referenced in the emerging CNDP via policy C4, which seeks to protect certain public views, this one being referenced under point three as view B. Next slide, please. This is a short video. Looking first northwest towards Garnham and the line of existing silver birch trees that forms that boundary. Turning now north towards the aforementioned view across Klehonga and the wider landscape and then following this hedgerow boundary up and then around to the southeast boundary and then across to the southern corner of the site and then finally down the southwestern site boundary and mature hedgerow where access is proposed to Poplar Road which lies the other side of this hedgerow. Next slide, please. Here members will see the floor plans and elevations of the proposed bungalow, which has a gross floor area of 145 square meters and provides three bedrooms with open plan kitchen, living and dining to the rear. The design of the proposed bungalow is simple in form. The result is an unobtrusive dwelling that retains some similarities to the surrounding built form by way of the proposed scale, massing and positioning on the site, as well as the materials, namely the facing brickwork and timber clad exterior. Next slide, please. Here are the floor plans and elevations of the proposed detached two-story dwelling, which has a gross floor area of 222 square meters and provides four bedrooms with open plan living accommodation and one bedroom on the ground floor. A further three bedrooms are provided on the first floor, as well as a northeast facing roof terrace. The two-story dwelling has a more detailed design and incorporates additional architectural features, such as dormer windows, a part glazed gable end, and a glass balustrade to the roof terrace. Next slide, please. Briefly, this shows the proposed attached garage, which will accommodate two cars and an office on the first floor with internal access. It's of note that the use of the garage is controlled by condition 11. Next slide, please. Here, members will see um, two sectional elevation plans of the proposal. Firstly, from within the site, and then secondly, set back behind the hedgerow boundary with Poplar Road. This demonstrates the height of the dwellings, taking into account the site's topography and the existing boundary hedge. It is also of note that further planting is proposed, which will add to the screening at this boundary with Poplar Road, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, if we could go to that, please. Here is the application, here's the landscaping plan for the application, which proposes a range of landscaping on the site to help mitigate any harm and integrate the proposed dwellings with the wider setting, as well as increase the level of tree cover generally. This includes the retention of the existing boundary trees at Garnham and a range of new trees planted along the northeast, southeast and southwest boundaries, as well as the proposed internal boundary between the dwellings. The tree planting includes field maple, crab apple, oak, damson, cherry and pear, and was reviewed by the council's tree officer and ecologist and is considered locally appropriate. If we go to the next slide, please, so members can see this more clearly. This just shows more detail um, of the previous plan with the location of the trees. So in summary, the application seeks planning permission for the erection of two residential dwellings with an associated garage and a shared vehicle access onto Poplar Road. In landscape terms, given the public view from Birch Hill will be disrupted, 
by the erection of the two-story dwelling, despite mitigating factors in, of scale and landscaping, there is an identified tension with policy C4 of the emerging CNDP, which is attributed moderate weight. In terms of the more general provisions of the core strategy, LD1, the application site is considered to be a naturally contained site abutting residential development, which will not have wider implications in regards to projecting in an unrestrained or inappropriate manner into open countryside. The loss of hedgerow on Poplar Road will impact the character somewhat, but the significant landscaping proposed will help to mitigate this and further integrate the site with its surrounding, while providing a marked increase in tree cover. In regards to the design, there is no uniform character to the dwellings local to the application site, but a large proportion utilise facing brickwork. As a development plan, an emerging CNDP seeks to control aspects of the design only by reinforcing local character and not through a prescriptive design guide. There is some flexibility to the acceptable styles and materials. Overall, the proposal, proposed design is considered to align with the requirements of both core strategy SD1 and CNDP policy 6. There is adequate on-site amenity for future residents and the window positioning and separation distance is considered sensitive to existing dwellings on the opposite side of Poplar Road. In this regard, the proposal is considered to conform to SD1. Now turning to the highways impact, the proposed access is supported by a seven day speed survey and the access parking and turning arrangements have all been reviewed by the local highways authority. While there has been some local objection to the proposal focused on the narrow nature of Poplar Road, the MPPF at paragraph 109 states that development should only be prevented or refused on transport grounds where the residual cumulative impacts of development are severe. Given that the visibility displays meet local and national requirements following a speed survey and the small scale of development, this is not considered to have severe impacts. In regards to sustainable transport, there are local and long distance public connections, public transport connections in Klihonga and condition five secures bicycle storage for the dwellings. In regards to biodiversity and ecology, the application is supported by a phase one ecological survey, which includes recommendations for appropriate mitigation and biodiversity net gain enhancements, and includes an arboriculture impact assessment. These have both been reviewed by the council's technical consultants, and the proposal is considered to adhere to core strategy LD2 and LD3, as well as the relevant sections of CNDP C4. Furthermore, as the site lies within the River Wye Special Area of Conservation, the Council's ecologist has completed the required habitat regulations assess assessment, which concluded there would be no likely significant effects on the SAC. Natural England have since reviewed this and returned a no objection. Finally, in summary, the application must be viewed in light of the fact that the Council is unable to demonstrate the required five-year housing land supply. As such, the MPPF directs decision makers to grant permission unless the adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits when assessed against the framework as a whole. The proposal is considered to adhere to the policies contained within the core strategy. However, there is an identified conflict with the emerging NDP in policy C2, which can be attributed limited weight and defines the settlement boundary, and in policy C4, which can be attributed moderate weight and seeks to protect certain public views. Overall, it is officers' view that the proposal does demonstrate sustainable development and the benefits of the scheme, including the social benefits associated with the proposed bungalow, economic benefits associated with the construction, and environmental benefits associated with the increased tree cover and biodiversity net game enhancements, are not significantly or demonstrably outweighed by the adverse effects identified, given the weight attributed to the relevant policies of the merging CNDP. As such, it is officer's recommendation that planning permission be granted, subject to the conditions set out in the report. Thank you, Chairman. That brings me to an end. Thank you very much, Mr. Gossett. Uh, we now have turned to our public speakers. Um, we have three, Mrs. Ms. Davis from Clonga Parish Council, Mr. Hastings, who I believe is now in the room. Mr. Hastings, can you, can you hear us? Yes, good morning, I can hear you. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Baum, the applicant's agent, who has made a written submission. Uh, so, Ms. Davis and Mr. Hastings have three minutes each. Now, if you're in full flood after three minutes, I will ask you to draw to a close. If you are obviously drawing to a close, I will allow you to go over the three minutes slightly. But uh, I will ask you to finish if, if you are still, I say, in, in full flood. First of all, I will call on Ms. Alison Davis on behalf of Cleonga Parish Council. 
Thank you. Good morning. I'm Vice Chair of Cleonga Parish Council and I chaired the NDP. A lot of parishioners worked very hard on the NDP, especially on the positioning of the settlement boundary. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has meant that the NDP has not yet been ratified and we are waiting for the referendum still to take place after the examination finishes. The committee were very keen to ensure that no further building took place outside those decided boundaries, preferring cluster developments to maintain the integrity of the village and not to have extended ribbon developments outside of those boundaries. The area this planning application relates to was seen as particularly important to retain an open countryside outlook. As I, as I have been told, you can actually see five counties from that point. It marks the beginning of open countryside around the village and is a much loved viewpoint. Indeed, it was used to illustrate the NDP consultation document. It is also possible to see a medieval field pattern from this viewpoint. Um, we don't see as this as infill and the parish council because it actually is at the end of a few houses built by the applicant, but it's about 100 yards away from any further development, which is down the lane next to it. Um, interestingly, an earlier planning application at Orchard Cottage along the lane was rejected on grounds of highway safety and being an open countryside. Um, one relevant finding from the NDP showed the need for smaller houses of two and three bedrooms and some four bedroom houses have been on sale in the village for more than a year. Cleonga already has more than double its allocation in this core strategy and this is already putting a strain on local roads and services, especially the doctor's surgery. This development falls outside the village 30 miles an hour speed limit and is in the 60 miles per hour designation. The lane at this point is very narrow and there have been several near misses on the corner there. The lane is extensively used both by walkers and by cyclists, but there is nowhere for pedestrians to stand if there is a car coming. And indeed, you cannot get two cars along there. One has to wait to come along that particular stretch. More cars along this lane will inevitably make it more dangerous for walkers and cyclists alike. Um, the lane connects to a series of pros and with the recent large increase in population is a vital link for the um, pedestrians to access these. The planned house in particular is not really typical of the nearby area with mostly cottages along the lane, apart from bungalow and chalet bungalows already built by the applicant and is more suited to an urban setting than rural Herefordshire. It is also much higher than surrounding properties, is on the skyline and will be visible from a considerable distance away. There is a badger set on the boundary of the planning application site and a very diverse flora and fauna are found around it, including a significant number of hedgehogs. The parish that council- th Your three minutes has expired. Okay. I'm I just wanted, just wanted to say thank you for listening to us and hope that you take notice of what the parish council thought and about thank it. You. Thank you for coming and speaking to us this morning. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Hayes, Mr. Hastings, who is a local resident. Mr. Hastings, in your thank own you. time. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Selden, uh, and Mrs. Davis. Thank you for your for your words. Um, the, the top of Birch Hill is indeed a, a beautiful viewpoint. I, I recommend a visit uh, on a clear day. There are five counties visible and many many hilltops. Of course, I could name them, but three minutes is short. The ridge height of the proposed element, as mentioned in the report in David's report or Mr. Gossett's report, section. 629 will partially obscure the view, of course. Section 617 states the proposed two-storey dwellings height will be an impact upon the views from Birchill. He mentioned that also. The proposed dwellings will undoubtedly and irreversibly detract from the area's open and idyllic scenery. scenery. I'm, I'm repeating almost Mrs. Davis's words. The surrounding hedges and fields are hundreds of years old. I have a footnote in my written um, statement, we have some 19, 1817 maps with them on. Some decades ago, Garnham bungalow was actually built on land with the agricultural tie, which has recently dissolved, of course. Although some sections of its hedge have been degraded, um, lorries and tractors running into it, etc. Birch Hill remains a wildlife haven and an important asset for the whole village's enjoyment. 
the insects it provide, provide a positive impact to the local agriculture. They are all agricultural fields nearby, for example, pollination. There are regular sightings of bats. And uh, yesterday, uh, although I haven't seen it, heard it recently rather, we saw the, the barn owl uh, just a few hundred yards away from Hilltop, which was lovely. The remaining rural character environment needs to be protected. Developments on greenfield land such as this one, such as this one described in the planning proposal, are a form of environmental war we cannot afford. The bulk, the prominence and design of this proposed, of these proposed dwellings, in particular the two-story dwelling, is out of keeping with all of the existing houses in the area, which are small. This point was acknowledged in the report at section 629, where it stated the dwelling is large for this area, which should be interpreted as a polite way of saying it will stick out like a sore thumb and from all aspects, from the village and from Hilltop itself. Not just the height, but the drawings show a total floor space, as mentioned, 222 square meters, not including the garage, for just the two-story building. This is nearly double that of all the surrounding cottages, which are approximately 110 like mine, or 120 square meters. On the uh, drawing title proposed site plan, we notice that the footprint of the double garage appears roughly equal to that of the nearby cottage on the same plan. It will be unlikely that such large dwellings can truly be assimilated given their stature and independence of character just by adopting some intermittent planting. Proposed uh, development again is outside the MPD for the village. It's in a 60 mile an hour zone outside the 30 mile an hour zone. It's on agricultural green. Mr. Hastings, your, your, your three minutes is up. So I ask you to draw uh, to a close. Then I, I just thank you very much. The loss of 20 meters of uh, hedgerow just, doesn't seem sustainable really, considering the, the modest social and economic benefits Thank you very much, Mr. Hastings. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, th th Thank you, and to you, Mrs. Davis, for your contributions. Um, can I now ask the legal advisers to read out the written submissions from Mr. Baum, the applicant's agent? Thank you, Chair. Um, okay. A review of the public consultation response is submitted by 24 named individuals relating to these application proposals reveals that in addition to 10 expressions of support, opposition is expressed by 14 respondents, which is focused predominantly on three specific subjects. Location of the application site being outside but immediately adjacent the settlement boundary defined in Reg 16 stage draft NDP, concerns about highways and safety, impact on reviews, sorry, on views surrounding landscape. I address each in turn. Site location NDP. As detailed in the case officer's report, the Cleonga NDP has passed through Reg 16 consultation, but has yet to pass through the independent examination stage which amongst other things assesses conformity of the draft NDP with all the strategic policies of the adopted development plan for Herefordshire core strategy. A number of formal representations were made during Reg 16 consultation, which will be considered during the examination stage. Some of those representations questioned conformity of CNDP policy C2, which defines the settlement boundary within which development will only be supported. This conflicts with core strategy policy RA2-1, which states support of proposals within or adjacent the main built up area of settlement. Until the CNDP examination stage is concluded, the MPPF dictates that the NDP as a whole can only be attributed moderate weight and the specific policy relating to settlement development boundary only limited weight in the consideration of these application proposals. Highway safety. Notwithstanding the objectors' concerns relating to highway safety, the case officer's report highlights that these application proposals demonstrably align with the policy requirements of both core strategy and MPPF in respect to the layout and proposed vehicle access. As such, there are no adverse highway safety impacts resulting from these proposals that would justify refusal on the basis of highway safety. Impact on views. Notwithstanding the protestations of the objectors to this application, there is absolutely nothing enshrined in planning law protecting a right to a view. The case officer states that this site is considered to be naturally contained site and these proposals will not result in development which projects in an unrestrained or inappropriate manner into open countryside, concluding that the character of both landscape and townscape have positively influenced the design. 
The case officer acknowledges in his report that appropriate acceptable design solutions have been de demonstrated within this planning application to all relevant technical constraints to development. There are no unresolved highway safety, landscape, ecology, drainage, design or other issues that could justify its refusal. In the context of the council being unable to demonstrate the five-year housing land supply, the MPPS tilted balance in favour of sustainable development is triggered unless the adverse impact of doing so would demonstrably significantly outweigh that benefits when assessed against the MPPF as a whole. The council readily acknowledged that in the current circumstances, the tilted balance is engaged in this case and there are demonstrably no adverse impacts that would outweigh the benefits of the sustainable development. As such, members are urged to approve this planning application. Thank you. Well done. That was in five seconds. Well, well done. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, can I now request that the Mrs. Davis and Mr. Hastings be put back in the waiting room? And, and I remind you that you can follow the proceedings this morning by tuning into the council's um, YouTube channel. Thank you both for your contributions this morning and good day to you. Thank you. So we'll now turn to the local ward member who is Councillor Hitchener. Councillor Hitchener is, um, he speaks first and then has the right at the end of the debate to, to sum up. I would em emphasize that he does not have a vote on this application. Councillor Hitchener. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this is a difficult, a difficult application, I think. Um, but just by way of background, I think you 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 really uh, you probably picked up the three main issues. But but the background is that <clears throat> Klee Honga um, in twenty eleven had about six hundred um, households, um, and um, it's now on the route to having another two hundred. So the size of the village has has grown by thirty five percent. There's a development by Persman, which is almost complete. There's another one which uh, is on the other side of the side of the village with another about 80, 80 properties to be built. So it's 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 a it's a village which has more than contributed to uh, the planning supply required by the county. Um, the uh, so so it it it's a significant increase. Um, the, the the in broad terms, the number that is required by the by the uh, county plan is about a hundred. Is actually delivering uh, two hundred, uh, and that has a significant effect on on the on the village. Um, of course, it can have a positive effect because it, it means it's more su sustainable in terms of, from an economic perspective and the shop and that kind of thing. Um, but I think that the, the, the village needs time to absorb that sort of increase. Um, so, so that's kind of um, by, by way of background. I, I also looked at the, uh, the core strategy and, and uh, there's reference to um, settlements which must focus a proportionate housing development. Uh, and so this is sort of the wider Hereford area. And if there are 23 communities in that list, which would mean an average of 81 homes uh, for each of those communities. And here, Klee Honga are putting up over 200. So, so it's an extraordinary effect on this community. Uh, and, and it then feeds into, into the NDP. Um, what struck me when the presentation went up was, was I think the first slide, which showed the red star of where this property is. And quite clearly, it's it's very much on the edge. It's on a bit of a ribbon. It's extending the village village boundary. Um, Mr. Gossett, and uh, I think he made, made a very professional presentation. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, but it it does show it's right on on, on the edge, uh, and and that I think is acknowledged. It's beyond the current boundary. In common with a lot of us, probably on the committee, our Parish councils have spent an extraordinary amount of time developing the NDP. They're frustrated by by COVID, the COVID virus. They they'd like to see it, it moving on. Uh, they spent a long time looking at it. They've decided that they they don't want developments in these particular areas. Okay, it's it's not been voted on yet, um, and there've been some some objections um, to, to to where the boundary should be. But they've spent an enormous amount of time on, on, on this process uh, and are very frustrated that having got this far, uh, building a planning commission is potentially going to be given, which is outside the area. Um, so the NDP, I think, is, is an important thing. OK, it's, it's, uh, it's not to be given a, a lot of weight, but it's still uh, in the minds of the people in the parish councils that uh, they've been working on this for ages 
and, and their efforts should be acknowledged in some way. The uh, second point is about traffic and access. You, you saw the video, you've, uh, you've seen, this is a narrow country lane. Um, it, very much so, it's just, it could be anywhere in the county, two hedges on each side. It's only one way at the top, there is a, a bend with a chevron and, and you can see, and I, I went there this weekend, and if you, if you came across a car on that bend, you'd have to back uh, several hundred yards, I think, before you can get to any passing space if you're going uh, east. Um, it's a little bit easier going west. Um, uh, vehicles perhaps don't, don't travel there fast, according to the research, uh, and that's because it's actually in a very narrow lane. But uh, um, there is a property which is um, which the, the drive goes into this road, and it's very difficult visibility. Um, it's 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 not a road um, which has any leeway. It's it's it is a narrow country lane, um, and I'm not sure that we should be building properties like, like this right on a, on a country lane. The third point is about the the review the uh, the view um, that's referred to in the in the report. Um, uh, it's 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 a principle. It's it's a strong objection. I think the the applicant hasn't helped themselves by by actually blocking that view. They put you might have seen in one of the photographs they put up uh, uh, a fairly ugly looking fence um, to to block that uh, that view. So I guess that works in, in favour of the applicant, but um, against them as as well. So to an extent, they've they've made sure no one can have the view in the future. Um, but that's kind of divided the community. Uh, you can imagine people walking up there and they used to have a view over a gate and now it's been blocked off. So they are, they are very irritated by that. That's not a planning ground, but it perhaps gives a little bit of background. Um, of course, the, the, there are two sides to it. Um, the, the person who's building, he's, he, he seems to be a very good builder. And I looked at the photographs and I thought, wow, they're a fantastic place to have a house. I mean, beautiful views. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not cramming the area. Uh, it, it, I just thought, you know, this would be fantastic, but but on the view that's going to be created for them destroys other people's views, um, and and the number who who are opposing it, uh, and and uh, are, are in support of it, you know, there's not that much difference between them, but I would point out the parish council itself are, are opposed to it, uh, as is uh, Allensmore uh, council, um, so I, I, I it's 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 difficult. Um, and I leave it to your wise judgment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hitchener. You have the right to sum up the debate after the debate. I have Councillor Watson to start the debate. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it's, um, it is a difficult application. Um, I've, I really want to say actually thank you to the applicant um, or the agent because um, the drawings are really quite incredible, quite detailed. Um, and I don't have a problem with the bungalow, but I do have a concern about the four bedroom dwelling uh, because of its height. Um, and whilst um, my uh, whilst the presentations were being made, I was reading Klee Honger's um, NDP. And I just wanted to point out about C2.13 uh, is about the grade two farmland land being used for housing. And that's very good agricultural land. And, um, and about the landscape, C1214, about the landscape being important, the design C6 on um, enhancing, does the development enhance local distinctiveness? Apparently not. C3, about the housing mix, the call for two and three bedrooms, whereas the bungalow is a three bedroom, but the larger dwelling is a four. C4.3, um, proposals need to respect the prevailing landscape character. And I'm just wondering, and this question is for Mr. Gossett. Mr. Gossett, um, was, I can't find a landscape officer's report. Can you explain why? Mr. Gossett? Uh, yeah, the, the, the internal landscape consultee wasn't consulted on this one. There was no trigger for them to be consulted um, and there was no, there, there appeared to be no need. Okay. And in that point, because, because of the moderate weight of the NDP, and I understand about the um, C12, I think you said, was limited, 
um, yeah, the limited weight around the boundary, but there is um, substantial well, moderate rate for C4. So I would like to put a motion for deferral so that we can actually have the landscape officer's report, please, because I think it's in breach of LD1, where proposal should conserve and enhance the natural, historic and scenic beauty of important landscape features. And this has been clearly set out in the NDP. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Um, you have made a proposition that this application be deferred. Is that seconded? Councillor... Councillor Fagan has seconded that. I will now put that to the vote. Uh, Mr. Brown, could we go round? Oh, sorry, is it? No, it's Ms. Evans is going. Um, the, the proposition has been made that this application be deferred for a landscape report. It's been seconded by Councillor Fagan. Can we, can we take a vote on that, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I will read through um, in order, uh, just for clarification. Um, I still got Councillor Graham Andrews on the list, but I haven't seen him attend. Um, if, if I can just have um, a response at the end of this vote, whether or not he is likely to turn up or I refer to him in, in future applications, I would be grateful. Um, so. Um. I, th I think so. Yeah. I must stop you. He, he has not been for the, in present for this application, I don't think. Therefore, Correct. he wouldn't have a vote on it anyway. So, um, right. uh, chairman, chairman, um, chairman, 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 I just, um, I just wondered if it might be worth seeking a view from the um, planning officer at this stage, perhaps before proceeding. Uh, uh, Mr. Brown, the, the members have made a proposition and it's been seconded that this application be deferred. Um, I think that uh, as it's not a, an outright refusal or a um, or a, uh, a, a approval, then we can take this motion as a one that's okay. going to go forward. And we will come back and we discuss it at another time, uh, and I'm sure we will, as, as it's a deferral, not a refusal or acceptance. So I would ask uh, Ms. Evans now to read out the uh, the names of the members for defer for or against deferral. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I can go in order I, I have on the list, and obviously that will include the sub, so it may be out of um, cr obviously um, chronological order, so please bear with me. So you have a motion to defer. Um, if you are agreeable to this deferral, please say for. If you're against, against, or you have the abstain. Thank you. Councillor Paul Andrews. For. Councillor Tillett. Four. Councillor Fagan. Four. <coughs> Councillor Foxton. Four. Councillor Stone. Four. Councillor Bowen. Abstain. Councillor Hunt. Four. Councillor Johnson. Against. Councillor Milmore. Against. Councillor Milne. Four. Councillor Durkin. Against. Councillor Selden. Abstain. Councillor Watson. Four. Thank you. Okay, that motion to defer has been carried. Thank you. That then, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the debate on that particular item until the, uh, the landscape <clears throat> report has been received. Um, Mr. Withers, would you like just to give us a time scale on that, please? Mr. Withers? Uh, uh, yeah, as, as Mr. Gossett inferred, this, this wasn't a, an application or, or a designated landscape that um, uh, was, would normally be a trigger. For, for, for landscape advice. Um, that's partly um, a resourcing issue. Um, I wouldn't necessarily like to commit um, hand on heart how long it would take for one of our landscape officers to, um, to take on board the, the resolution, but clearly we'll be communicating with them the urgency of that. And we shall have to, to, to look ahead um, to the schedules of meetings uh, coming forward to, to see how quickly we can, we can, we can slot this one back in. Um, I think the, the the fact that the resolution is is to enable a, 
uh, one of our offices to look at the site will hopefully not not delay matters um, uh, uh, such that um, you know such a, that a, 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 a deferral for a for a member's site visit might at the moment. So so let's um, let's let's prioritise it and, um, uh, and and get in touch with our colleagues uh, as a result and and, uh, and and bring it back as quickly as we can. Thank you very much, Mr. Withers. Uh, it is now 26 minutes past 11. I will declare a 10 minute adjournment comfort break. Um, can I either ask therefore that the live stream be suspended? Thank you. Thanks everybody. We'll come back at um, 31. Helen. Yep. Um, there are three people with their hands up, um, you know, Councillor Stone, Councillor Bowen have had their hands up for a while and, and now Councillor Johnson. You're muted, uh, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm not anymore. Um, yeah, I, 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 I am of the opinion that if we have a res resolution for a, a, a site visit or B, a deferral, on applications that that stops the debate because it then comes back to this committee to be debated again so i, I wouldn't want to um, duplicate any debate so if, if we have that then yeah. i would put that auto my view is that we should put that automatically to the vote um and then we'll come back and debate it out on another day chairman point of order if i may um this public meeting point of order is a, is a, a procedure it, it is it yeah. is yes we have stopped recording therefore this is no longer a public meeting and you are Correct. i believe you're proposing to take three representations from councillors is that appropriate i'm not no i'm not i'm just explaining why i suspended the meeting when i did this, this is a bit, we'll come back um ladies and gentlemen let, let's say 20 to 12. we will reconvene Good morning again, everybody, and welcome back to this planning committee meeting. Um, slightly, slightly extended uh, adjournment. I hope that wasn't too inconvenient for anybody. Um, we now move on to agenda item seven. And can I request that Mr. Spreckley, the public speaker for uh, as a virtual attendee is admitted to the meeting. Yeah, and are you able to do that because you're your host at the moment? Uh, oh, uh, oh, uh. <clears throat> Sorry, John, I've got feedback. Bear with me. What do you need to do? Sorry, John. C can we admit Mr. Spreckley, please? Yeah. It's okay. I put, I put him in, Jen, hopefully. Excellent. Sorry, I had to have the back ah, as well. I apologise. Thank you for that. And um, welcome, Mr. Spreckley. I will call upon you to speak uh, in, in, in on application in due course. But welcome anyway. Thank you, Chairman. So, um, I'm getting some feedback from somewhere. Okay. So we are now on to agenda item seven, the second application of today, which is um, land opposite Millhouse Farm, Found Hope in Herefordshire. The proposed attenuation pond as part of a proposed surface water management strategy for extended extent extant planning permission reference 163707 for 15 houses on adjoining land. Uh, who, who's presenting this one? It's Charlotte Miss Adkins, I believe. It is, Charlotte, yes, thank you, Chair. Hi. Thank you.
Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I'd just like to draw members' attention to the update um, sheet. Welsh Water have reconfirmed their position, which is already set out in paragraph 4.2.1 of the committee report. And two further representations have been received from um, two of the objectors to the application and a further comment from a member of Found Hope Parish Council. And these are summarised on the update report. And there is no change to the recommendation. Starting with the presentation, this site, site lies on the northeastern side of the B4224 at the northern northwestern extremities of the village of Founhope and is demarked by the Red Star. It is situated within the Wye Valley area of outstanding natural beauty with the river's meandering course on the opposite side of the road. The Woolhope Dome lies to the northeast, which includes Cherry Hill Wood, a site of special scientific interest. Next slide, please. The existing site plan, which is in the bottom left hand corner of the slide, indicates the application site in red with other land in the same ownership in blue. The Millhouse Farm complex lies to the southwest on the opposite side of the road and the farmhouse barn and adjoining granary are grade two listed. A public footpath runs parallel with the roadside hedge within the site before linking to another public footpath at a right angle which then continues in a northeasterly direction um, before taking a southeasterly alignment into Scotch Firs. That's to the east, southeast of the housing development area. As shown on the proposed site plan, plan information is sought for an attenuation pond with associated earthworks and drainage pipes, which would comprise part of the proposed surface water drainage for the extant residential development for 15 houses to the southeast, which is shown in blue. The existing access is off the B road and would be utilised for any maintenance vehicles with a grass reinforced parking turn turning area provided. A non operation, sorry, an operational and non operational water main runs approximately between the proposed siting of the pond and the roadside hedge. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The upper plan is the proposed site layout and demarks the position of the flow control from the attenuation pond to the southeast of the vehicle access. The bottom left hand plan is an illustrative detail of a detention pond, sorry, detention basin, which has been modelled for a one in 100 year plus 40% for climate change water level with a 300 mil freeboard above the design level. It would have gently sloping sides at a gradient of one in four. The bottom right hand side drawing is a cross section of the attenuation pond approximately midway down its length and demarked AA on the proposed site plan above. The broken line indicates the existing ground levels and the solid line the proposed. Next slide please. The uppermost drawing is a dry base and cross section which again shows the gently sloping sides and the detailed design. It includes a geotextile wrap to prevent silt infiltration and a fully slotted field drain. The lower drawing is the dry basin site plan, which indicates the maintenance parking turning area at the bottom and the position of the hydro brake chamber. Next slide, please. The photographs of the site are labelled and in turn clockwise from the top left are taken from the approved housing site Looking towards the siting of the proposed attenuation pond, the roadside hedge can be seen on the left hand side of the image. The top right is the existing vehicle access off the B road, which would be used for maintenance purposes only. The bottom right is taken from that access looking southeast towards the village and shows the banked verge and the hedgerow. The bottom left looks west across the application site towards the B road with the proposed siting of the attenuation pond partially beneath the electricity cables that you can just about see on the photograph extending towards the vehicle access. The application seeks permission for a surface water scheme to serve the approved housing development for 15 dwellings on adjacent land, a site that's allocated in the Found Hope Neighbourhood Development Plan. Although drainage details are conditioned on that permission, a planning application is required for this surface water drainage scheme because it is on land outside of that application site and also includes engineering works to regrade the land and provide drainage infrastructure. 
There are no objections in terms of landscape impact, ecology, public rights of way or highways subject and conditions. Natural England have concurred with the habitat regulations appropriate assessment that subject to conditions the development would have no adverse effect on the integrity of the River Y SAC or Triple SI. The land drainage engineer has confirmed that the proposal is acceptable in terms of its overall technical details. However, some elements of outstanding finer detail can be conditioned as per recommended condition four in the report. Furthermore, the land drainage engineer has highlighted that the applicant or developer would need to negotiate with adjacent landowners to complete remedial work to the land drain before a connection can be facilitated. Dependent on the legal status of the strain, it could be a civil matter between those relevant parties. An informative note highlights that the grant of planning permission does not imply any right to enter third party land. Welsh Water have confirmed that they have no objections subject to a protection zone either side of the operational and non-operational water main being maintained. The applicant is aware of this and an informative note again brings this to any future developer's attention. As set out in the conclusion section of the report at paragraph 6.31, the scheme proposes a suitable surface water drainage scheme to enable the granted housing scheme on an allocated site in the Founhope Neighbourhood Development Plan to be delivered. In the context of the Council's housing land supply position, this is a, is a significant consideration at both county and parish level. The proposal is considered to accord with the development plan, the core strategy and Founhope Neighbourhood Development Plan, and there are no material considerations that indicate an alternative decision being made. On this basis, it is recommended that permission is granted in accordance with the statutory duty, the core strategy policy, triple, sorry, SS1 and paragraph 11C of the MPPF. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Ms. Atkins. Uh, we have two representations, uh, Mr. Danes, who is an objector who has made a written submission, and Mr. Speckley, who, as you can see, is a virtual att attendee, get my words right, attendee. Uh, I'll ask now Ms. Adams to read the uh, written submission from Mr. Danes. Ms. Adams? You're muted. Formal objections to the above mentioned pond together with photographs to support our fear of the pond adding to the flooding potential at this point on the B4224 have already been made by three of the five people owning land beyond, sorry, below the pond. Some 23 years ago at my request and cost, a drainage pipe was built across our properties to alleviate the regular flooding on the road. Initially, this worked well with Herefordshire Highway is responsible for maintenance. That service has deteriorated drastically over the years to a point where the pipe damaged since February 2020 hasn't been repaired in spite of numerous requests made by Mr Morris and myself. We requested a visit from a technical advisor to explain the workings of the proposed pond. The person directed to us stated he knew nothing about such ponds but presumed the developers hoped to put a pipe in 4224 to link up with the present damaged pipe across our land. This was reinforced by email from Ms Atkins stating, with regards to the outflow from the attenuation pond, this to the land drain that runs from the highway across yours and Mr Morris's land with an outfall to the River Y. The applicant would have to negotiate with you and other landowners to complete remedial work before a connection could be facilitated. I am deeply disappointed with the manner in which a presumably responsible body in the form of highways has been lax in the maintenance of the present pipeline. How can I possibly agree to a similar agreement with another perhaps more transient organisation? We have no desire to accept water onto our land from the proposed pond. Also, there's no outlet into the river. Instead, the water forms a pond on Mr P Morris's land. I was informed that part of my email recording the minutes of the meeting with the council's representative was to be redacted. Any redaction means my observations will not be a true and accurate reflection of our meeting. Both Mr P Morris and I object to such alterations. Strangely enough, the deletion refers to the damaged pipe and not the attenuating pond. The exec exit from the proposed estate of houses is above the B4224 and almost opposite Millhouse Farm driveway. Excess water from the regulating pipes is stated to flow down the estate road to be picked up by the existing drainage system of the B4224 road. This drainage system does not exist. Water however, across the road and down the Millhouse Farm driveway, thus causing flooding problems to the four properties it serves. This is encapsulated in the case of Rylands and Fletcher, judgment of the law and water on neighbours' land. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. 
Um, I now ask Mr. Speckley, it is your turn. Um, you have three minutes, um, begin now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I thought it might be helpful if I took this opportunity to briefly explain how this proposed attenuation pond will work in practice. In basic terms, the attenuation pond collects all of the surface water runoff from the 15 houses to be built on this allocated site. It stores this water, reduces its volume through natural percolation into the soil, prevents any storm surges onto the highway, and then discharges any excess water over time at a restricted rate of no more than the greenfield runoff equivalent, i.e. the natural flow that must be accepted by downstream riparian owners, both under common law and the Land Drainage Act. This will discharge under the road and connect into the existing land drain that then runs southwest across third party land and discharges into the River Wye. All of this has been designed to adoption standards in accordance with the adoption criteria set out by Welsh Water and in close consultation with your land drainage engineer. This will result in a significant improvement to the status quo, substantially reducing the existing flooding on the highway. There have been some questions raised as to the legal status of the land drain where it runs under third party land. There are only two possibilities. It is either a highway asset on the basis that it was originally installed by Amy acting on behalf of Herefordshire Council as the highway authority who have maintained the land drain, or it is a land drain where the maintenance of the pipe is the responsibility of the riparian landowner who must accept the natural flow of water from upstream. The appropriate authority in this case will be Herefordshire Council again, acting as both the lead local flood authority and the highway authority. In either case, it is a matter of significant public benefit to ensure that the surface flood water that currently collects on the public highway is drained away. In addition, there is significant public benefit in securing the delivery of 10 open market houses and five affordable houses given the accepted shortfall in the housing supply in the county. I hope that this clarifies the position and enables councillors to be able to support this proposal as recommended by our officers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speckley. Um, can I now request that you are put back into the waiting room and remind you that you can follow the uh, proceedings of this committee uh, on the council's YouTube feed. So thank, thank you very you. much for your contribution, Mr. Beckley, and a very good day to you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, moving on now to the local ward member. Um, as the local ward member is the applicant, uh, it would not be appropriate for him to uh, speak on his behalf. So we are looking at Councillor Sebastian Bowen to fulfill the role of the local ward member for this item. He is a substitute member of this committee for this meeting but he is acting as the local ward member and therefore he does not have a vote on this application. Councillor Bowen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councillors, I will not detain you long. You have heard excellent, clear expositions from the planning officer, Charlotte Atkins and Mr. James Spreckley, who is the agent. I believe this is the key application which will release the building of 10 open market and five affordable houses. The five affordable houses will form half of the required amount postulated by a recent housing needs survey. And I believe that every consultee is now content with this application and are satisfied that it should be approved. Um, I think this, this, um, this includes the Y Valley AONB, Welsh Water, the Ramblers, Parish Council, and uh, almost every Tom, Uncle Tom Cobble you can think of in the way of uh, consultees. So there's been a very thorough response, there's been a very thorough response in approval. Um, particularly the Parish Council, which, who, which is, um, I think, a very important point. They've been really, really very positive about this. Uh, we have got a problem with the landowners below the site, but the landowners below the below this site are actually obliged by legislation to receive water coming from above. And the, that is, I think, a very important point to make. And the dealing of, with the pipe, et cetera, is, 
I think, I believe, a civil matter, uh, and it has to be resolved like that. Uh, the management of the attenuation pond and the orchard, which is built around about it, planted around about it, is conditioned, and I believe that all the ends are tied up satisfactorily, and I encourage you to approve the application, which will add satisfactorily to the housing supply, in particular, the five aforementioned affordable homes. Also, no harm will be done to the Y Valley AONB, and the flooding problems on the road running past the application site will be vastly improved. And I do ask you to approve this application. I think it is important. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bone, and you will have the right to come back and sum up at the end of the debate. Could I just ask our officers to clarify the legislation that uh, requires landowners to uh, receive water coming down from, from above them? Mr. Withers, Ms. Evans? Well, it is a legal um, it is a legal provision, as I understand it, and 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 Mrs. Evans can obviously assist if I if I go wrong. But it's um, in in the context of this this um, this situation, the, the the position is yes, um, adjacent landowners are legally obliged to receive um, surface water uh, in the way that's been described. Um, it's understood that there are clearly um, difficulties for the adjoining neighbours who maintain strong objections to, to the application. Um, my point here is that these concerns, whilst you know, no doubt genuine, um, are not matters that are material planning considerations. We have a we have a proposal that meets all of those technical requirements. There may be uh, separate uh, civil or, or private legal issues regarding the um, the way in which uh, the water communicates with the land drain under the neighbour's land. But but those are matters that are outside the scope of this application uh, and therefore shouldn't shouldn't be be troubling you in relation to your assessment of the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Withers, for that clarification. Members, uh, on to a debate. Does anybody wish to speak on this application? Councillor Fagan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, whilst I have um, concerns uh, regarding the objectors um, points, as um, Mr. Withers has pointed out, that th those aren't considerations for, th for this committee. So um, I, I feel actually that uh, um, a lot of care and attention has been taken to try and get this application right. Um, the, the reports are uh, extremely comprehensive. The the reports from both Welsh Water and the um, the drainage team, Herefordshire Council's drainage team, are extensive as well. And um, I I would uh, move that we um, put this forward for um, uh, to go with this application. Sorry, I lost my terminology there. For approval, Councillor Fagan? Approval, thank you. That's the word I was looking for. So, yes, I would suggest that we approve this application. Thank you for that. Is there a seconder for that? Councillor Andrews, you, you I think you were there first. Yes, thank Council you. Uh, yes, Councillor. I'll, 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 do, do you wish to speak now or later? No, no, carry on, please. Thank you. Councillor Watson. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I I found this a really tech, you know, about the drainage, extremely technical. So um, I just feel that this is outside my expertise or understanding. So um, whereas I can, um, I'm not sure if I can support it, but I think I'm going to abstain from this one. Thank you, Councillor Milmore. I can see no material reason to object to this application and I will be supporting it. Thank you for that. Are there any further speakers? Uh, Councillor Milne. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I, I would agree with the observation a minute ago that, that, um, uh, that there's quite a lot of technical information here with, this, with regard to the drainage, which um, 
as, as non-specialists by and large as members we and we um respect and, uh, and accept the uh, uh the consultants uh, reports and the officers analysis of them um I, I I don't. Can I just ask uh, the case officer whether the environment agency was consulted? I I, I just um, I wonder whether, although as I understand it, the connection with the river is existing. It's not. not we're not forming a new connection. Um, the, um, the 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 effect of this this um, scheme presumably will be to increase. Uh, the water discharge at that point, in view of the fact that um, it takes the water away from the, both of them, from the houses and uh, the water that naturally falls from the, from the hill, um, and um, uh, it, it is a hill which um, has uh, seen a, a considerable amount of uh, soil wash. So uh, you, you notice from from the from the road, there's a, a, a very considerable build up of material at the bottom. Um, four or five feet higher onto the field where um, the soil over the, over the years has sort of moved its way down. So um, it's, um, it's, it's clearly a, a, a quite, a, quite a, a sort of a, a mobile hydrological environment um, in, in terms of the effect of the water on, on material and the water itself. I, it's a rather muddled request for clarification on on this point of the environment agency, have they, did they, were they required to comment on the discharge onto the river? Um, I'm looking at the case officer to for, for a response on that, yeah. Lily. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Milne. Uh, Ms. Atkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to confirm, the environment agency aren't a statutory consultee on this application. Um, as set out in the report, the ecologist and natural England have been consulted in terms of the impact um, of the water from the housing site um, reaching the river. Obviously, that water falls on that land anyway and reaches the river. Um, this application would pump that to the attenuation pond. So overall, probably the amount of water wouldn't discernibly increase it's it's channeled instead of just flowing off the land and also it's attenuated and that attenuation system also includes um, silt um, removal within the attenuation pond so the offer of advice we've had from the council's land drainage consultant is that there would be an improvement um, because the the water would be attenuated the flow would be limited and you wouldn't have those surges um, so hopefully that covers all the issues that you've raised but if not obviously just just let me know thank you thank you Ms. Atkins. councillor tillett uh, thank you chair um just a, a brief observation uh, uh, agreeing with councillor watson's observations but disagreeing with her conclusion i'm afraid which is that uh, we are all in the same situation, I'm sure here, that none of us are experts. This is a very technical uh, application, uh, way beyond any of our uh, expertise or indeed pay grade. Um, and therefore, uh, we do very much rely on specialist technical advice and reports. And in that respect, um, thank you, Ms. Atkins, for both the, the, uh, the, the written report and the presentation you gave at the start. And also I thought Mr. Spreckley's comments were equally helpful, very professional and very technical. And in the face of that presentation and that evidence, uh, I cannot see how we can do anything other than support this application. And that will certainly be my position. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Tillett. Are there any further speakers? I see none. Uh, I thought I'll ask Mr. Withers if he has any further comments. No, Chairman, I think everyone recognises the technical nature of the application. There's been a huge uh, amount of uh, time and effort given to it on behalf of our statutory and internal consultees. The recommendation is, is before you, and um, I don't think I need to add add anything further. Um, all, all technical consultees are on board supporting the application. I do recognise the concerns that have been raised uh, by, by residents and, and third parties over which um, uh, who, whose land is potentially affected. But, but as I say, that's not, um, not a material planning consideration in the context of this particular application. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Withers. Uh, Councillor Bowen, you may sum up, please. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think, uh, Councillor, all your councillors who've spoken have uh, obviously done some of your, your homework, and thank you very much for that. Uh, Charlotte Atkins's report on the attenuation pond, I think, is very interesting and very germane. It is a means of slowing down the flow of water from a field or a site, not for speeding it up. The whole point of keeping the water back and letting it go out in a much slower way. So in fact, it's a, it's a better way of dealing with the water and the landowners below the site actually ought to be pleased that this attenuation pond is going in because it'll make their problem less, I believe. It'll, the water will still eventually go down to the Y, but in a more controlled way. And of course, you must remember that water from the sky in the form of rain comes down on the field and on the housing estate, but it doesn't make the housing estate doesn't make the water uh, grow in size or anything like that. It's the same amount of water falls at any rate. Some people think that because it is falling on a on a property, it it makes it makes it worse, as you might say. It's not so. Um, it will all go, except for a very small amount from the from the driveway, it will all go into this attenuation pond, be retained properly and let flow out in a more gentle way than would have happened otherwise. We have all the consultees in approval of this particular application and that includes some people like the Ramblers who are very often very fussy indeed and Welsh Water with their pipe and, the, and their easement which makes it, them particularly happy. And in every way, I would encourage you to support this application. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Bowen. Uh, we have a proposal on the table from Councillor Fagan, seconded by Councillor Andrews, that this uh, application be approved. I remind members of the committee that you can only vote on this application before the committee if you've been present for the whole of the presentation and of the discussion on the application. Does anybody need to advise me that, I, that they are not permitted to vote? I see a nil return on that one. I will therefore ask the legal advisor to ask each committee member in turn to state how they vis wish to vote. Ms Evans. Thank you, Chair. Um, just for clarification, the last point when uh, you asked for Mr Withers or myself to respond, any matters of uh, connection for drainage or over land are, as Mr. Withers has confirmed, they are civil matters, they are land law matters, uh, they, are, they are not related to planning. Planning is obviously where the, the application is granted and the landowner or the applicant then has to fulfil the conditions to be able to um, commence the development. If they can't do that because they haven't got the appropriate authorities in place from the landowners, then that is a separate matter. I hope that clarifies the position chair in any event. Um, so members what you're looking at at the moment. Thank you Ms. Evans, yes. Thank you. What you're looking at at the moment is the uh, motion that has been moved that planning permission be granted subject to the conditions are set out in the report and updated report. If you could please confirm by saying whether you are for, against or abstain I would be grateful. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Paul Andrews. For. Councillor Tillett. <coughs> For. Councillor Fagan. For. Councillor Foxton. For. Councillor Stone. For. Councillor Bowen. Oh, so my apologies, he can't speak, he's, he's acting as ward member, apologies. Councillor Hunt. For. Councillor Johnson. For. Councillor Milmore. For. Councillor Milne. For. Councillor Durkin. For. Councillor Selden. Councillor Selden, did you hear me? For. Thank you. And Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Watson. Abstain. That motion has been carried. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Holmes. Unless there is a urgent need for a further comfort break, I will continue on now to the next item. Very well, I will continue. Um, could I ask that the speaker for agenda item eight as a virtual attendee, Mr. Teague, 
is admitted to the meeting. Good afternoon, Mr. Teague. Mr. Teague, can I check that you can hear and see us? I can see his camera, but not Mr. Teague. Um, advice, please, on how to proceed. Uh, Mr. Teague, uh, we can see you. Can you hear us and uh, can we uh, check your microphone? Chairman, would it, would it be of assistance if I contact you, Mr. Teague? Yeah, if you could, please, Councillor Durkin. Um, I, I am anxious that Mr. T hears the whole of the debate and the officer's presentation on this. Uh, it's adjournment. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. We are now at full complement for this, this this item, which is item eight, I believe. Um, so moving on to that, we have Mr. Teague now. So we are considering an, an application at St. Michael's Church, Bram Brampton Abbots at ross on Wye for the change of use from a place of worship to community space, including artisan bakery, cafe, and social space with occasional worship proposed various internal works, including mezzanine and installation of an artisan bakery and change of use to the vestry and nave to include all associated works and new service connections. Um, I think Ms. Morgan is presenting this one. I am, yes, thank you, Chair. And in your own time. Obviously, I'll just wait for the presentation to come up. Uh, thank you. This application relates to a site located on the southwest of an established residential area in Brampton Abbots, approximately 1.3 miles to the north of Ross and Wye Town Centre. This is indicated on the map by the Red Star. For reference, this application is assessed against the local um, Herefordshire Plan core strategy, whilst the National Planning Policy Framework is a significant planning consideration. The site falls within the Brampton, Abbots and Foy neighbourhood area where the plan is at referendum stage and can therefore be afforded significant weight. Next slide, please. The church itself sits within a large cemetery which is lined by a tree boundary, allowing generous space between the surrounding dwellings. To the north of the site, there is a strip of land proposed to be utilised as the car parking area for the proposed development whilst the south of the site is open countryside as evident in the aerial image. Next slide, please. St. Michael's Church is a grade two star listed building, the oldest element of which is 12th century with later works identified up to the 20th century. The building was closed to the public in 2008 due to concerns over the structural stability of the roof. Uh, this has since been repaired as well as the upgrading of services and structural works, which was completed in 2019. The application seeks listed building consent and planning permission for the change of use of the building and internal works to allow for a multifunctional space, including the creation of a mezzanine floor utilising the fabric of the pews. The building would comprise a bakery and cafe and the continuing use as a place of viewership as well as community space. Next slide, please. The principle of development is found to be acceptable in 6.3 and 6.8 of the report. The core strategy policy CS1 supports the proposal as a retention and enhancement of an existing social and community asset to be utilised for facilities available for local residents. The church is within a settlement and can be safely accessed by foot and cycle given it's within a res residential cluster with a nearby village hall. Given the existing function as a place of worship is being retained, this is in adherence with the policy whilst presenting additional community services to ensure the funding and continued viable use of the heritage asset. 
This is reinforced by core strategy policy RA6, which supports proposals that diversify rural economy, including proposals which promote and the sustainable use of the natural and historic environment as an asset which is valued, conserved and enhanced. Furthermore, policy E1 supports the enhancement of employment provision and the diversification of Herefordshire economy. As the proposal makes use of an existing community building, the diversification of use of the heritage asset ensures a positive impact upon the rural economy and the surrounding community. Next slide, please. As previously stated, the Brampton Abbots and Foy Neighbourhood Development Plan is afforded significant weight, reinforcing a number of the core strategy policies. Policy BAF7 seeks to protect and enhance existing community facilities and directly states preferred plans for the church that development would bring back the church into a place of worship with a certain level of commercial activity to fund it which would complement the village hall. The scheme satisfies these requirements whilst not conflicting with other policies BAF 2, 3 and 4 given the external character and landscape is not impacted. Furthermore, policy BAF5 of the NDP ensures proposals for small scale rural businesses are supported where they do not have a significant adverse impact upon the landscape character or residential amenity. More specifically, the policy encourages proposals which utilise conversion or reuse of an existing building where the building is suitable for such a conversion without rebuilding or disproportionate extensions, which is certainly the case in this instance. As such, it can be concluded that the principle of development is supported by local and national policy, given it provides a sustainable use of an existing community infrastructure, which protects and enhances the heritage asset, creating a public space for local use and rural employment opportunity to support Herefordshire economy. Next slide, please. With regards to design, the only proposed change to the external appearance of the structure would be the installation of small extraction fans, one from the bathroom facilities which would not adversely impact the character of the building given its scale, and the kitchen extractor fan which is proposed to expel air through the ceiling void into the roof valley as indicated on the floor plan, therefore not visually impacting upon the significance of the building. The established street, street scene would remain unchanged, ensuring no landscape disturbance is caused by the change of use in accordance with policies SD1 and LD1 of the core strategy. Policy BAF2 of the NDP reiterates that requirements for development to contribute to the sense of place whilst utilising existing infrastructure. The church is a vital building contributing as, to this as a heritage asset. Therefore, the lack of external amendment is supported by policy. Next slide, please. Uh, so to understand the site's relationship to the settlement, I've included some videos of the road leading to the church. Uh, this just shows the road coming towards the site from the east with dwellings on both sides of the road. These are relatively spaced and the entrance gate of the site is at the corner of this turn. Uh, just visible in the distance. And the next slide, please. Uh, this video is just a continuation of the road heading northwards. Um, the proposed entrance to the parking area is just behind that van, which was briefly unloading at the time. Um, you see this to the side, the dwellings are again relatively well spaced with vegetative boundaries. <coughs> Next slide, please. As discussed in paragraph 6.11 to 6.12 of the report, as the church is disused, any proposal would increase the current level of use and therefore movement to and from the site. However, given the nature of the proposed use as a cafe and bakery with community space for local gatherings, it is considered that this increase in movement would not create a de de detrimental impact upon residential amenity, as these operate under generally sociable hours of business. These hours of opening have been secured by condition to secure to ensure their sociable hours are maintained, whilst opportunity is available on Friday and Saturday evenings to host later events with a closing time of 10pm. 
Though the bakery element of the scheme includes an earlier start for the baker and goods deliveries, the modest scale of the business would not give rise to a level of noise which would warrant refusal. In addition to this, the deliveries have been conditioned to take place within the sociable hours of 6am and 4pm. Furthermore, it is noted that proposed B1 business uh, use class has raised some concern. However, it should be considered that it is by its nature appropriate for this location, with its description being light industry appropriate in a residential area. As such, any noise nuisance caused by movement on or around the site must be of an acceptable level within the residential area. This suitability is reinforced by the lack of objection raised by the Environmental Health Officer for Noise and Nuisance. Though the use class itself secures the appropriate level of industry on site, the use of bakery within the B1 status has been conditioned. Therefore, any proposal to make the use of the church for anything other than this specification would require planning permission and as such assessment of its suitability. Uh, just for reference, the top left image shows the church in relation to the surrounding dwellings, which can be seen behind the tree boundary. The top left image shows the closest dwelling to the east of the church, which comprises no window openings to the adjacent elevation, ensuring there's no loss of privacy to the residents. Uh, the bottom images just show the road to the left and right of the entrance gates, indicating the location of adjacent neighbouring dwellings, which are sufficiently distanced from the church itself, given its setback nature within the site. Next slide, please. As discussed in section 6.13 and 6.14 of the report, with regards to heritage matters, the advice set out in paragraph 193 of the NPPF is relevant, requiring great weight to be given to the conservation of a designated heritage asset. The more important this asset, the greater the weight. Paragraph 194 advises that any harm to or loss of the significance of the asset should require clear and convincing justification. Paragraph 196 goes on to state that where a development proposal will lead to less than substantial harm to the significance of a designated heritage asset, this harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal, including securing its optimum viable use. Policy LD4 of the core strategy states development proposals affecting heritage assets and the wider historic environment should use the retention, repair and sustainable use of the heritage asset to provide a focus for wider regeneration schemes. Given the scheme makes use of an existing unused heritage asset, retraining the stru structure and the character of the building for sustainable use ensures the viability of the listed building itself in the future, according with point three of this policy. Furthermore, policy LD4 states development proposals affecting heritage assets and the wider historic environment should record and enhance the understanding of the significance of any heritage assets to be lost, wholly or in part, and to make this evidence or archive generated, uh, generated publicly accessible and where appropriate, improve the understanding of the pu and public access to the heritage asset. Whilst the scheme increases public, as public access to the asset, the submitted heritage design and access statement also indicates that the applicants have commissioned a 3D scan of the interior of the church as a record which can be presented as evidence to future generations as a virtual reality. Furthermore, the creation of documentation and evidence is conditioned with any approval to ensure this is undertaken to a sufficient standard. Next slide, please. It is noted that the building conservation officer raises objection to the scheme on the basis that the removal and reuse of the Caro pews wouldn't constitute a less than substantial harm to the significance of the heritage asset. However, due to the church's listing status as grade two star, this harm has been attributed more weight by the officer in accordance with the increased historic significance. Next slide, please. Although this harm is identified, the proposal retains an acceptable proportion of the internal historic furniture, ensuring the ecclesiastical character of the asset is evident. The repurposing of the pews ensures the evidence of previous human activity is not removed from its setting, but is indicated in a new way, given the pews detailing is not lost through rearrangement, as is evident in the plans. Furthermore, it is reasonable to consider the retention of pews within the space to pose a restriction to the current flexibility of the scheme. The siting of the pews within the large body of the main church would limit the space available to be used for the proposed activities. Next slide, please. 
In addition to this, a number of the choir stools are to be converted into freestanding seating areas shown in the red box on this plan. Whilst not all evidence of Caro's work within the church will not be completely lost from the building, given the chancel is being retained. As discussed in section 6.18 and 6.20 of the report, Historic England have attributed significantly less weight to this less than substantial harm identified, whilst confirming no objection is raised to the scheme, given the proposals are sensitive and can serve the significance to a considerable degree. When reverting back to the paragraph 196 test, the identified harm is greatly outweighed by the public benefits of the scheme, given the sustainable, viable use for the heritage asset and the significant measures mitigating any harm. In this, planning balance is engaged. Next slide, please. With regards to movement around the site, the scheme is assessed against policy SS4 of the core strategy, which seeks to ensure new developments are designed and located to minimise impacts on the transport network. This is reinforced by policy MT1 of this core strategy, ensuring highway safety is maintained. Um, again, this is echoed in policy BAF8 of the NDP, which protects highway safety and impacts of traffic. Given it's an existing community facility, it is considered to be in a sustainable location, sited within an established residential area. Due to the nature of the proposal, the bakery and cafe with a community space, it is proposed to serve the local residents and it's therefore expected that many sustainable modes of transport will be utilised, including walking and cycling. The provision of secure cycle parking to encourage this is included in condition. Um, as well as a conditioned travel plan containing measures to promote alternative sustainable modes of transport for staff and visitors to be submitted prior to the first use. When a larger event is being held, such as an evening community activity or a religious service, parking provision for 14 vehicles is proposed to the north of the site with an associated turning area as indicated on the plan. The area engineer has raised no objection to the scheme with condition to secure safe access to the site. Next slide, please. So for ease of understanding, this video um, is included. And this just shows the relationship of the parking area to the adjacent church um, and the access point and the access road in front. Apologies for the van, it was a little in my way. Next slide, please. This image just shows the parking area as it's existing. It is noted that queries have been raised at public consultation regarding the ownership of this area. Um, it's my understanding that an agreement has been made through the applications process with the parochial church council between themselves and the applicants. Um, however, it should be noted that this is a civil matter to be resolved and is not a material planning consideration. Next slide, please. When assessing the ecological impacts of the scheme, policies LD2 and LD3 of the core strategy are applicable, stating that proposals should conserve the biodiversity and geodiversity of the site. Um, the BATS report submitted with the application makes several recommendations, um, the implementation of which has been secured by condition as recommended by the Council's ecologist, who raises no objection. In terms of drainage, the application form states that foul water will be disposed of by a connection to main sewer network and all surface water is to be managed through on-site soakaway infiltration. These methods align with the aims of policy SD3 and SD4 of the core strategy, which indicate a hierarchy of preferred water management methods, as well as a deer with Welsh water's consultation response and suggested conditions. Uh, the ecologist has offered no objection to these and they are considered compliant with local policy. The HRA screening assessment identified no likely significant effects as discussed in section 6.30 of the report and Natural England have raised no objections subject to the inclusion of conditions which are stated in the relevant section of the report. Next slide please. With regards to the objection received, a number of these have been dealt with through the consultation process including a waste, a waste management plan. Uh, amended site plan showing the proposed waste storage area and collection point was submitted for consultation with waste management as indicated within the red square. No objection was received from the consultee and it is considered to be acceptable with regards to residential amenity and appearance in line with policy SD1 of the core strategy. Next slide please. To conclude, the principle of development is acceptable in adherence with policies CS1, RA6 and E1 of the core strategy. 
supporting proposals that make use of existing facilities, providing community space and services for local residents, whilst actively encouraging the rural economy. As previously discussed, this is directly reinforced by the NDP policy BAF7, which aims to bring back the church as a place of worship with commercial opportunity. In assessing the impact upon residential amenity, it is considered not to be detrimental and protected by the inclusion of conditions and appropriate use classes. The Ecologist Waste Management Officer and Area Engineer have offered no objections to the scheme with suggested conditions included to ensure that these matters function safely. With regards to heritage matters, the less than substantial loss of an element of this listed building is considered to be outweighed in the planning balance by the significant public benefit to be derived from community facility, providing services and functional space in an existing structure on a sustainable site. This new use will allow enjoyment of the unused heritage asset for future generations alongside the substantial evidential documentation of these church as it currently exists. Therefore, in accordance with the golden thread of presumption in favour of sustainable development, which runs through the NPPF, the proposal does not conflict with the policies of the local plan and emerging NDP and poses no material considerations to indicate the refusal of the scheme. As such, it is recommended for approval subject to the conditions laid out in the committee report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms Morgan. That's a very thorough presentation. Uh, we have three representations from um, members of the public. Firstly, a, from Mr Lewis, representing Brampton Abbots and Foy Parish Council, who's made a written submission. Mr Teague, who is with us today as a uh, virtual attendee. And the Venerable D. Chesdy, Chedzi, uh, who is for the applicant, who has made a video submission. So if I, we may start, uh, could I invite uh, our legal representative to, to read out the... Um, Submission from the Parish Council, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is on behalf of Robert Lewis, who's the Chairman of Brampton Abbott and Foy Group Council and represents the views of the Council. The Parish Council previously considered the applications for change of use and... Oh. Chair, I'll hold until it comes, comes back on, if, if I may. Yes, th thank you, Ms Evans. Uh, have we lost the, re, uh, the stream? Um, I'll check for you now, uh, Chairman. Bear with us if you could uh, just uh, adjourn the meeting temporarily. We'll wait for you to come back, John. Are we back? Bear with me, Councillor Selden. I'm just going to confirm that. Bear with me. Yes, we're back now. Thank you. Um, we have got welcome back. We were as far as hearing from the uh, Brampton Abbots and Foy Parish Council who made a written submission. Ms Evans, would you read that, please? Thank you, Chair. This is on behalf of Robert Lewis, who is the Chairman of Brampton Abbots and Foy Group Council and represents the views of the Council today. The Parish Council previously considered the applications for change of use and listed buildings consent at an extraordinary meeting on the 26th of November 2019. After lengthy discussions, representatives from BACRG and careful consideration of the plans, it was resolved to object to the proposals due to the following reasons. An artisan bakery is not a suitable project for a historic building like St Michael's Church. Concerns were raised about the term light industrial use in the planning application and how this would adversely impact on the community. Potential impacts on the neighbouring residents. Proposed early and late operating hours six days a week from 4am to 10pm. Additional lighting emanating from the building. Additional noise from staff, customers and delivery vehicles. Increased vehicular traffic, delivery vehicles, waste collections, staff and customers. Safety concerns surrounding the collection of industrial waste bins when the car park is in use and full. 
parking issues for residents when a busy event is taking place in the church and all spaces are occupied? Will the bakery staff and delivery vehicles park on the roadside? These plans propose to create a social space which might impact on the ongoing plans to restore the village hall as a community space. The parish council has recently secured an £81,000 public works loan to restore and reopen the hall following its closure in 2018 due to storm damage. Finally, I'd just like to say that the Parish Council is not opposed to BACRG's plans to make use of the church. However, we do not think an artisan bakery is appropriate for this historic building and surrounding area. We also think that the business plan is not viable to have an artisan bakery in this location with the overheads that will need to be met. It would not be desirable to allow this listed building to be altered in this way if it does not succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Evans. We now come to Mr. Teague. Uh, you you have three minutes, Mr. Teague. Um, I, I will warn you at three minutes uh, to, to, to wrap up, but I won't stop you if you're coming to the close of your presentation. So, Mr. Teague, in your own time. You're muted at the moment. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear me uh, now. Good, I was on, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I live close to St Michael's Church, uh, not on the photographs that you saw, and I'm also representing a group of concerned local residents. This group has always supported the church project and accept that there has to be a certain level of commercial activity to fund the ongoing church costs. However, this needs to be balanced to ensure that the activity is a positive and not detrimental to or out of keeping with the amenity of the surrounding area and the community. The church is in an idyllic, unique and quiet rural area in an AONB and in close proximity to a group of houses. This group of residents is not alone in its concerns. You will note of the 21 objections, including the parish council, with only one letter of support. Unfortunately, the case officer's report does not, con does not convey the full weight of the issues and concerns. We welcome the case officer recommending restrictions on use. However, allowing the bakery to be in use for six days a week for the start of 4 a.m. and the cafe restaurant open every day and up to 10 p.m. on a Friday and Saturday has to be excessive. There has been no noise assessment, especially important with an industrial extraction fan and possibly three people working in the bakery. The application also refers to non-residential institutions and other uses in the hours of opening section. What is this? If they relate to existing user rights, they need to be taken into account when the application widens the use. Up, in, up until now, the church has only been used as a place of worship anyway. The adjoining car park is crucial to the viability of this project. It has not yet been secured. There are no other parking opportunities in the area other than the side of the road. If the committee is minded to grant permission, it should be subject to the securing of the car park and keeping the right to use it. There is no provision for an overflow car park that would be needed. The applicant has confirmed that the car park area will only be used for car parking for the church. Again, any planning permission should restrict this space to car parking only. Uh, the, the case officer seems to have failed to address these points. We disagree with the case officer's statement that the scheme complies with the parish NDP. The proposed level of activity would have a significant adverse impact upon residential immunity. This application needs very careful consideration. The case officer has recommended approval, uh, recognising the need to restrict activities and times of opening. We do not believe that this has gone, gone far enough and has missed some important areas that need further clarity and restrictions. This application should not be approved in its current state or on the case officer's recommendations. We would have deep concerns for our parish if it does. This project, is, this project is not like a normal commercial business. If it fails, and there are many who have doubts about it, then the parish will have a high price to pay. St Michael's is too special to spoil. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Teague. That was almost spot on. Um, and finally, we have a representation by video from the Reverend D. Chedzi. Um, could we play that, please?
Sorry, Chairman, just be a, a, couple, a minute or so. Sorry. How are we doing, Mr. Brown? I'm sorry, I can't seem to be able to access the screen to share. Sorry, sorry, I can't seem to be able to access the, the screen to share. Um, uh, Tim, do you want me to try? Yeah, go on. Sorry, John. Yeah. No, I'm afraid we're having problems with this one, uh, Councillor Selden. Um, Tim, are you able to read the, um, the, the statement out? You're on mute, Tim. Ms Evans, advice, please. Chairman, if I might ask, is it possible for the audio to be played instead of the video? Apparently not, Councillor Durkin. Unfortunately, um, bear bear with me. I may be able to. I may be able to do that. I'm I'm not sure how well you'll be able to hear it though. Um, Chair, I was going to add that the other alternative, obviously, if we have the speech as well as the video, they're not, as you said, Mr. Brown would would, would read out or I would read out the, the actual speech that went with it. I haven't got it at the moment. OK, but can, can, can we abandon the video idea then and, and read the speech out then, please? Please. As said, Chair, I haven't got it. I'm just waiting for Mr. Brown to confirm. Yeah, und understood, Ms. Evans. Thank you. Do we have a copy of the uh, the words that we can read out, please?
Yes, no? Sorry, Chair, I'm within one minute. Right, I, I, I think I can now share the video. Bear with me. We have no audio. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Um, I, I, I can hear the audio coming through mine, um, but I take it um, none of the other members can hear it. OK, um, no. I think I think we will have to revert through to the, uh, the, the spoken uh, note that, that, that has come through. So who's going to do that then? OK, I'll go, Chairman. OK. Well, thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. You have three minutes. Yep, righto. OK. I would like to make three points in favour of the application being made by Mr. Tom Froggart on behalf of the uh, BACRG. Firstly, this application has the support of both the church commissioners and the diocese of Hereford. This follows almost 10 years of consultation with the local community and the Church of England authorities. This plan has not come out of the blue. It has had a long and careful history with many options being rejected along the way. The diocese and church commissioners, wherever possible, want churches, even closed ones, to remain at the heart of their communities. During all of this time, the church has been closed. In Church of England terms, it is redundant, and the application comes out of a strong desire to allow the church to remain a community facility and asset. Redundant churches are of little use to the community, and wherever possible, finding community use for closed churches is always preferable to them becoming private spaces. As a result of this approach of repurposing the church as a community asset, over £400,000 of grant funding was obtained to restore the building. Secondly, and perhaps most importantly, this application has significant public benefit. Historically, churches were community facilities, and there is strong evidence from across the country that many churches often had brew pits for beer and bread ovens to provide food for the poor. They would have been at the heart of the community, not just for life events such as birth, deaths and marriages and worship, but as social gathering places and community spaces. In church terms, it was the late Georgian and Victorian period where churches became almost entirely sacred spaces. It could be argued strongly that this application returns the church to its, its historic use at the centre of community activity. In a village-wide survey conducted in April 2019, which gained a 60% return rate, the majority of the local population were either supportive or very supportive of this project. At its heart, it is about giving the church back to the whole community. This in no way sets a precedent, as already in Herefordshire, churches such as St. Le St. Leonard's Yarpole, which has a village shop, post office and cafe, St. Peter's Peter Church has a community hub and cafe, and the cafe at All Saints in Hereford have already shown the way. Finally, the design and reordering of St. Michael's Church has the support of Historic England, this major body that works to maintain, enhance and support our most precious landscapes, historic buildings and churches, has no objection to the plans. In fact, they consider the proposals to be thoughtful, sensitive and conserve its significance to a considerable degree. The design is sympathetic to the history and purpose of this church and brings back into use an otherwise redundant building which might otherwise be lost to the wider community. 
churches are and never have been static buildings. They have grown, developed and changed throughout their history. St Michael's is no different. Over its thousand years of history, it has changed and developed. This is simply the next phase in its life. I support this project because it has public benefit. It gives the building That's back. three minutes, Mr Brown. You've Last sentence. Minutes. It gives the building back okay. to the community rather than taking it away from them and offers a sustainable future for a building of historic significance. Thanks, Mr Brown. Uh, Councillor Bowen, you have your hand up. Is there something, uh, a point of order? I just wish to speak on this this topic. Okay, well, let, we'll let Councillor Durkin uh, do the, the, the ward member role then. Um, I can now request that Mr Teague is put back into the waiting room um, and remind him that he can watch the rest of the proceedings of this meeting on the Council's YouTube channel. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Teague, and a very good afternoon to you. So now we turn to Councillor Durkin, who is filling, fulfilling the role of the ward member for this item. He's a substitute member of this committee for this meeting, but he's acting as the local ward member for this item. Therefore, he can speak and sum up, but he does not have a vote. Councillor Durkin. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, firstly, can I thank Miss Morgan for the very detailed and comprehensive report. Um, it was a pleasure to read. However, there are some problems. Uh, firstly, could I ask, in the application form at 22, there's a term other. What does this refer to? Is the first question. If I can continue, Chairman, to save time, yep. I, I, I will. Right. Um, the location is, as you have seen, in a very quiet hamlet in an AOMB, Lower Wye Valley, with an NDP which can be afforded, as you've heard, significant weights. Now, my concerns and the community's concerns relate to both individual and cumulative effects of most important parking, noise and hours of opening. Um, generally, the community is in principle in support of the uh, venture, but there are a number of issues. SC1BAF7 uh, of the NDP uh, would generally complement each other. And RA6 definitely supports rural economy to this type of venture. But if I may go to the concerns, the first one is noise. Uh, as I say, houses are very close proximity, as you may have seen on the video, which was so helpfully put forward. The baker will attend at 4 p.m. in one vehicle, one assumes. However, in design access statement at 3.6.2, it says that there are more than three personnel would attend the site each morning. Does that mean there can be three people attending at four o'clock in the morning? Now, my concern there is early hours of the morning, door slamming, etc., etc. Because what happens then is that uh, at six o'clock, as a commercial bakery, we have a vehicle turning up. And I'm told that it's a transit type vehicle that would then be delivering and collecting. Now, before six o'clock, we're going to have a, a, a perhaps a lot of noise going on. I have spoken with both um, representatives from the BACRG, and I've also spoken, obviously, with the parish council and local community. And there will be problems associated with the loading and unloading, with a further van, transit type again, attending later in the day for collection and deliveries. There is also, a, as you've heard, a fan fitted installed on the roof. I was informed that the ovens are electric and do not need to have any ventilation at all. But nobody can tell me of the DB rating, the decibel rating of the fan that was proposed to be put in at the roof level into the valley of the church. Now, taken collectively with the um, people going into the, into the church as bakers, and the fan turning on, etc. Uh, that does cause the local community some concern on regards to noise. But the main element here is the parking. Uh, Course Trusty MT1 refers, to, and I'm not sure, I, I believe the local highway network on its own cannot absorb the potential level for traffic. At 6 a.m., the officer understands that agreement has been made 
at 6.24 of the report, the officer understands that an agreement has been made with the parochial church council for the use of the car park. It has not. I have had a uh, view of, uh, I had a meeting with Bark, as I, as I said, and they assured me that heads of term were approved or close to being approved and that lots of positive noises were coming from, from the communication. I have had email from a member of the PCC, the Parochial Church Council, that says about the heads of terms, uh, it says, uh, told that the heads of terms for the car park lease have been agreed. This is not accurate. We have agreed several key terms, but still have points outstanding. BACRG have published two weekly updates, and, and this one I'm referring to is the 29th of July. The second one has a heading of next steps, and, it's, and it lists the points on the header terms of the car park yet to be agreed. Confusingly, it goes on to say the header term have been agreed, but with the diocese about the church building. And I then later received another email from the member of the PCC who says that Whilst we have agreed that there will, that most would consider it to be the, I beg your pardon, Chairman, what we have agreed, what most would consider to be the items of most importance, rent, term, use of car park only, we have still to work out how to prefer the right for the PCC to use the car park to access the churchyard, for instance. Maintenance of the churchyard is the key responsibility of the PCC. So we don't want to inadvertently exclude ourselves from accessing the car park at particular times. Now, what this means is uh, I appreciate that car parking uh, lease agreements is a civil matter. But what we have got here, which is not quite what uh, Ms. Morgan has understood, is that it is the car park has not been agreed. So all the flow of traffic and parking would rest on that very narrow lane, which you saw with the second video, uh, going around the corner. So that's where the traffic would park and where the traffic would hopefully flow past. Um, and finally, um, obviously the, the car parking is essential, therefore this matter should be at least, in my opinion, deferred until the lease agreement or some legally enforcing document is available so for both parties. Finally, from my, my perspective here, I'm looking at the hours of opening. I notice on the actual application form, the hours of opening are from uh, Monday to Saturday, 9 till 4, and Sunday, 9 till 4. Um, that's with Sundays and bank holidays. But it suddenly changed from 9 to 1800 on Sunday to Thursday, and 9 till 10 o'clock Friday and Saturday. And for an enlightened industrial use, it's gone from uh, four to four o'clock to five o'clock. That's the van and the baker. And the other one, what was on the application form, four till four o'clock. Now, this is an increase in hours, which, are, which not, does not sit well with the locals, because what we have here, we have uh, hours of operation up till 10 o'clock, Fridays and Saturdays. That's a heck of a time for people um, to have to um, listen to noise or experience parking if this par parking cannot be established. Um, the sort of community are associated, are, are, as I said, are broadly accepting of this application as being um, a, better, a good use of the church. But of these three things that are causing them some concern, the most of all is the is the car park, which is yet to be agreed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Durkin, and uh, I'll come back to you to sum up at the end of the debate. Um, can I just seek some clarity from our officers? There, there as Councillor Durkin has just pointed out, there seems to be some discrepancy between the hours of operation of the bakery and then the hours of operation of the, the building itself. Are the two separate or are they part of the, one of the same? And are, therefore, are any of those 
activities going to be covered by licensing legislation rather than planning legislation. Uh, and some clarity on that from perhaps Ms Evans and Mr Withers, please. I, I might defer to, to Elsie in relation to the various hours of operation. My understanding is that we have sought to um, pick apart the various aspects of the use and apply an appropriate level of, of control in relation to the hours of operation. Is it, is it okay if I just defer to you on that one, Elsie, just, uh, and I'll come back on the other point. Yeah, that's no problem. So the, the change in uh, hours of use compared to what was on the application form was actually in response uh, to the concerns over the flexibility of the site if the bakery were to not be successful for any reason um, and also to cover the community uses as you know a village hall type um, setting so the um, a3 restriction of the cafe from nine till six sunday to thursday is considered to be a you know a, a relatively sociable hours and just um, the later close just encompasses that additional community um, facility use as well as the later closing on week uh, Fridays and Saturdays sorry um, that just allows for evening events to take place to further fund um, if the cafe and bakery were to either be unsuccessful to not fulfill these roles um, successfully um, a separate restriction is for the um, deliveries so this is separate to the b1 use that restricts the deliveries alone between the hours of 6 a.m and 4 p.m so that is separate to the b1 use um, i think that answers i hope that answers your question thank you very much yes uh, councillor bowen thank you mr chairman a uh, very interesting proposition. And this brings me back to Yarpol Church, and then as Yarpol, mm -hmm. which I was uh, very much involved in, where we converted, a, well, not converted, I suppose, we reordered a very ancient uh, grade one church in, into a very vibrant, extremely well used local facility. Uh, it is still a place of worship and used on a very regular basis. Hatches, matches, dispatches, and regular services. Also, it has an excellent village shop, outstanding, may I say, with a cafe uh, placed above the shop and sometimes operating outside as well. It has been a huge success and used greatly by the village and also by uh, tourists, either on bicycles or on the feet or on in all sorts of ways. And if this is as half as good, it will be a, a great asset to the village, I think. My, I do have a concern about the benches, the Corot benches, which the Victorian Society uh, is concerned that they're taking away too many of them and they're not going to be uh, properly looked after. Uh, it would be interesting to have seen a bench or had some representations of them. And uh, is there, the, I know there's some work being done to uh, make use of them, which is, I'm glad to hear. Uh, and also the the, the work in the in the chancellor itself is is causing some sort of uh, concern to the Victorian Society. I don't know if any comments can be made on that by the planning officer, uh, because I do think it's an important point. Once you've wrecked these things, you can't get them back ever. Uh, but on the whole, I very much hope that this this project will go ahead and be a great success. We don't have a bakery in St Leonard's, but we do have a very vibrant post office, village shop and coffee shop. And also it's used by uh, the Yarpel singers and all sorts of, we've had plays in there. It has become a very, very successful operation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bowen. Uh, Ms. Morgan, do you want to make any comment on the use of the pews? Yeah, that's no problem. So as I state in the report, um, there is a less than substantial harm that is identified with the um, reuse of the pews. So obviously they are being reused in a different way. They're being repurposed. Um, but what, what it does do is it maintains the fabric of the um, heritage asset and of the history, the um, evidence of human activity within the setting of the church. Um, so it's maintained there rather than being removed and put somewhere else for use elsewhere. Um, additionally, the um, evidence, the uh, condition to secure 
sufficient evidence of the church as they as it appears now the pews as they appear now in their in their setting um, is included to ensure that this is accessible for future generations um, and also to a sufficient standard as as I stated the applicants have commissioned a 3D scan of the church as it currently exists um, but obviously we've included condition for with any approval to ensure that this is a sufficient, um, sufficient standard. Thank you Ms Morgan. Mr Withers do you put your hand up do you want to say something on this subject? Uh, only only really just to add um, uh, that that the applicant was um, afforded an opportunity um, to review um, the extent of uh, the the re, re well the loss of the pews. Let's let's not beat about the bush. The pews will not be retained in their uh, original form, um, largely in the context of the objection from the Victorian Society and and the Building Conservation Officer for the council. Um, so we did have um, a round of further discussion about whether or not there were alternative ways in which some of those pews might be retained in situ. Um, the response to that was after consideration that that would compromise the the usability, should we say, of the space that's been identified for, for, for the cafe use. So there is a, a linked um, sort of balance, I suppose, to be struck between, um, you know, finding a viable use uh, and seeking to try and retain what are obviously recognised as important, you know, aspects of the listed building. And, and uh, as I say, there's no, there's no suggestion that there isn't a degree of harm here. Our view is that it's less than substantial and, and outweighed by the benefits that, that would arise from, from the proposed use. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Withers. Um, Councillor Watson. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, and again, I just have to reiterate, um, thanks to Ms. Morgan for, the, uh, for her report. Um, and I hear the uh, residents, parish council and ward councillors concerned about the noise in car parking. Uh, for me, uh, this proposal brings new life and it reminds me of a healthy living centre I once saw, uh, the Bromley by Bow Centre in London. It's on a smaller scale, of course, in um, uh, Brampton Abbots. Um, but look, Learning, and for me, learning about uh, that there's been a 10 years of consultation um, uh, was quite an insight. I support the application, but I'm wondering, um, because interestingly, my mum used to run a very successful cafe bakery in um, her residential um, in the town where we lived and in, um, in a residential area. But she actually um, had her opening hours much later. So not opening at nine, but opening up at 11. So therefore not needing to get any deliveries um, until around eight or nine o'clock in the morning. And um, I'm wondering if that could be a change uh, to... Um, ask that the bakery is opened later and the cafe. Um, and the second point is about the condition around the car park um, is that, um, because I think that that is a concern if you're going to have people there to, and I understand that it's a civil matter, but is there a way of making that a condition um, that um, the application can be, uh, go through once the car parking um, agreement has been made. So they're the two points around changing the opening hours and B, the car parking. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Watson. Can I come back to the answer to those questions um, when we've had a little more debate? Because I think the car parking issue may well come back with other members. Councillor Stone, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, the, Mr Teague said in his presentation, St Michael's is too special to spoil. Well, I absolutely agree with him, but I don't feel from what we've heard this afternoon that uh, the church is being spoiled. There's quite a debate going on nationally about the future of our parish churches in rural areas. And uh, not for this committee, but churches do need to adapt to survive, particularly in these difficult times. This plan, I feel, will bring back worship, which, which will be great, and also will benefit the wider community as well. So I feel very much it's a win-win situation. Uh, as far as having a cafe in the church is concerned, there are other examples of this around the diocese and around the county. And um, I think it's a brilliant idea having a cafe open six days a week because it'll not only benefit people in the village, but it'll bring in visitors as well. 
and benefit the local economy. As far as the bakery aspect is concerned, I realize there are, um, people are concerned about the noise levels and it opening too early. But all I can say is that some years ago, there was a bakery in Brimfield where I live, and I can't remember any complaints about noise. They were certainly open early in the morning and worked all hours. So I think there are, are examples of bakeries that work um, quietly without a lot of noise and being sensitive to the community. As Councillor Bowen has said, there are other examples in the county of successful conversions like Yarpole. And I visited Yarpole with its cafe and other facilities quite a number of times and the many events that go on um, in the church as part of the community. I accept um, Councillor Durkin's concerns about a number of issues, including car parking, issues that have yet to be agreed, but I hope those can be agreed with goodwill on all sides. And basically I feel, Mr. Chairman, this is a very good plan, which I wish every success to. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stone. Councillor Fagan. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, actually, as, as somebody who does quite a lot of community fundraising, I think to actually have got to the stage where they could restore the church um, and, and have a plan for its viable use thereafter is really deserves applauding because it's not an easy thing to do and it takes a huge amount of work. And the, um, the fact that um, substantial consultation has happened with the community. I mean, they would not have received the funding if this consultation had not happened. So I, I do believe that the the sort of wider community is probably behind this plan. Um, but but I I recognise that there there are some concerns. Um, it's it's unfortunate that the Karo features um, will will have to undergo change. But I think if if our village churches are going to survive, that change is inevitable. And um, I welcome the fact that they've actually been sort of reabsorbed into the fabric of the building rather than being sold off. Um, in, in terms of the, um, the noise concerns, I'm just wondering if this is something that uh, would, would be, could be monitored by environmental health if complaints were received. So, so that was one question. And, and then I also had the condition about um, the question about conditioning the car parking. Is it, is it possible we, we could um, put, put this uh, uh, forward to, to go with the um, proposal, but on the condition that the car parking was agreed with the PCC? I imagine it's within the PCC's interests to actually get this church up and running again and um, so I, I don't think that that is unresolvable. Um, and, and furthermore, I just wanted to say that I think given these times, um, sort of the inclusion of an, an artisan bakery within a, a village setting is actually something that should be welcomed. And uh, I certainly wish that it was something that could happen in, in our village. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fagan. Councillor Milne. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. I um, I just wanted to pick up on Councillor Barron's uh, comments on the Victorian Society's advice, which, um, uh, um, given in December before lockdown, they were clearly um, able to go and have a look at it, unlike, uh, unlike us good selves. But the um, Victorian Society uh, did um, object, uh, well, did, did support in principle, but object on, on the basis of the proposal to move the Cairo benches, so many of them, um, and indeed all of them, um, apart from a few in to survive in modified form. Um, but they were all, almost more concerned about the choir stalls. They considered it unnecessary, the proposal that they might be moved, they should, uh, that they were there to be moved um, to facilitate a second entry into the vestry, aka the, the, the bakery. Um, and I, I think, uh, given that the uh, historic buildings officer also objects, um, we, we, we need to give uh, um, much weight to, to this. Um, I um, take the case officer's point that uh, in the balance, um, 
although I think we would regard it as sort of, without being too technical, at the upper end of, of less significant harm to outweigh upper end of less than significant harm, I think we have to show considerable public benefit. And that means um, non-commercial public benefit. So I, 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 although I um, understand that comparisons have been made to say All Saints in Hereford and, and to, to Peter Church, Church, which will also which will be ordered, um, I and mean, Peter Church has a library, of course. So it's, um, and it, and it maintain, it continues in liturgical use, well, as indeed All Saints does. Can we have a condition which, if this, uh, if this application is approved, that preserves that non-commercial public benefit, um, so that uh, people who go along, um, uh, uh, who just want to um, enjoy the space or, or worship in it, um, may do so. Um, so, in, a, in other words, I am looking at, at the the hours of opening. Now, the hours of opening, as expressed in the condition, are limited. Um, there's no guarantee that it will be. We're running out of time, Councillor Mill. Can we have a condition which which gives us some guarantee that visitors can enjoy it in a non-commercial space, religiously or otherwise? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, uh, can I seek some clarity on the issues? Then I'll come back to you, Councillor Tillett, if I may. Um, the the um, the issue about the car parking is is this a planning matter or a civil matter? Is the first question. Um, if it's a civil matter, do do we need to put a condition on it, or are we able to put conditions on it? That's the first question. Mr. Withers, do you want to answer that one? You're on mute, Simon. My apologies. Um, uh, yes, from 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 what I've uh, heard uh, this morning regarding the negotiations that have been taking place, it, it does seem that there is a, a collective will to make the car park available, um, although some terms uh, remain unresolved. Now, in, in planning terms, um, where there is a reasonable certainty that something may happen, and I, I'm not going to suggest that one way or the other what the situation is with regard to this, that, that will be for your judgment, but where there is a reasonable certainty that some other operation or, or, or matter will be addressed, then you can impose what's called a Grampian condition. So, so effectively that in this case would be saying there shall be no commencement to the development that would be approved here until such time as the full details of you know, the, the availability of the parking and how it will be retained for all users, you know, the PCC users of the of, of the church, you know, community events and so forth. So the, there is a, I think there is legally a basis upon which we can do that, where we feel that there is reasonable certainty of there being an outcome. If, if there isn't reasonable certainty, then the condition would be uh, ultra vires because we're eff effectively attaching a condition that could not be complied with. But I, I personally don't sense that that's the case here. Um, the other point I just wanted to pick up on, if, if it will help, is that there is no reason why we could not condition um, the uh, attenuation, if it's needed, of the, the roof-mounted um, fan. So, so there would be an, the ability to secure with you know, technical input from our environmental health officers exactly what that specification is and whether or not it needed any form of, uh, you know, attenuation, uh, baffling or whatever. Um, so, so that is, if that, if that puts some councillors' minds at rest about the the noise issue, um, that will that can certainly be uh, attached. Um, picking up on Councillor Milne's point, I'm less uh, less convinced uh, regarding the ability to condition public access um, in the way that I think he he perceives it sort of as part of the whole public benefit balance. Um, ultimately, this is there is possibly something for further discussion maybe with with the applicants around that, but I, I don't wouldn't want to advise or recommend to the committee that we proceeded with a condition that sought to um, require um, public access in some in some manner that that may not be considered commercially acceptable um it's possibly something that might um 
warrant deferral, um, maybe delegation to officers. Um, but but um, as for a condition that that I believe goes beyond what I think I can advise the committee on today. Thank you, Mr. Withers. Uh, Councillor Tillett. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a couple of points. Um, to come back to the um, issue of the pews, if I could perhaps take a slightly different slant on it. Um, in a very ancient church, these Victorian pews are a modern addition, which were probably opposed at the time. Um, and uh, I think the way in which they are being retained, repurposed, to use Miss Morgan's very appropriate phrase, I think is very imaginative. And I think visitors to the church will be rather intrigued to see how the pews have been reused in, in a different way to the, to the benefit of, of this um, change of use. So I don't see that as being a problem. What I did have a problem with, which is a, is a new point, in the presentations uh, from the parish council and from Mr. Teague, they seem to um, want to have their cake and eat it. Um, they, they have raised a number of concerns about the large number of vehicles coming and going, the traffic, and yet they also use the expressions, what if this proposal fails? What if this business is not viable? Well, it seems to me you can't have it both ways and that actually um, the success or otherwise of this business um, venture is not a material planning concern. And if it was to fail or not prove to be viable, um, that is not something that we should be considering. So I think I do think this is an Im imaginative idea. Uh, we've seen other examples across the county um, where it does work. Uh, I think a church staying empty for over a decade is a shocking waste of a, a heritage resource. And um, I hope that we will be able to support this proposal. Thank you. Mr. Withers. Sorry, thank you for allowing me to come back, um, Chairman. I just also wanted to add a, a further point in relation to the car park, and I think within within the context of of my advice around a condition to secure the parking, there there is all, also the provision to um, uh, secure restrictions over the use of the parking. Um, I think that was a concern that was raised about sort of. Um, uh, uh, excessive activity if we didn't have some degree of control over its use in with regard to, to, to activities taking place within the church. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Withers. Um, are there any further speakers? So in the absence of any proposition on the table, uh, members, I will propose from the chair that this proposal be approved with the conditions around the noise attenuation around the fan and the completion of successful negotiations to um, secure the car parking. Um, in, um, there. So from the chair, I will propose that. Is there a seconder? Yes, Mr. Car um, Mr. Chairman, I will second that. You've gone silent. Councillor Milmore. Yeah, I, I was just going to second that myself as well. Thank you, Councillor Milmore. Um, so with uh, Councillor Watson, you're jumping up and down. <laughs> Sorry, um, it was just my question about opening hours wasn't answered by the officer. Ah. You know, when I was talking about my mum's cafe is that she delayed the opening hours so that then the delivery vans wouldn't be arriving um, before 6 a.m. in the morning. Sorry. Thank you. OK, can, can we answer the... Um... Well, I think the, the, the conditions on the um, on the, the opening out and the delivery vans, um, Mr. Withers, are we able to condition? We've got conditions there already for that. Yes. So. Yes, Chairman. The, the condition on deliveries does actually prevent deliveries before six a.m. Right. Okay. So I, I've made that. Approach. It's been seconded. I think Councillor Bowen got there first. I did. Uh, this to be approved subject subject to those conditions. Can I now go back to um, Councillor Durkin before we take the vote? Thank you, Chairman. I have a number of things to say. Um, interesting there that uh, hours of opening are not material consideration, and yet we've gone 
uh, planning department have gone overboard to extend the hours to 10 o'clock. So it must be something. And who goes into a project if it's not going to be successful, which seems to be the matter coming back from what I've heard. If a project expected to fail, why, why are we not being more that? Why are they not being more strict on what they're trying to do with the hours of work? Now, the survey that went out, and other, and as I understand it, the other surveys and considerations that were covered before over the last ten years, they haven't gone into any level of detail. And this one, this doesn't go into any level of detail either, really, because it's a 10 o'clock finish. What else is going to be other than a cafe and restaurant? What are the other activities? Um, the, the community, let's, let's get this right. The community are broadly in favour, and it's great to hear anecdotal evidence from a couple of members here about how well that they, a cafe bakery type thing, have, have achieved in their area, which is wonderful to hear. And we hope, I hope, that this happens in Brampton Abbots. But I've got to be practical with regard to this. Um, the understanding is, and I know you, 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 you've you recommended the Grampian condition as a way forward, but I would ask that any conditions that are proposed could be passed by the ward member first, if, it, if that would be something I could I could ask for. Um, with regard to the church pews, etc., the Karoo, I didn't mention them because I thought, I thought Ms Morgan dealt with them quite eloquently in her address. But I did pick up the fact that if it could be, if the application regarding the pews, etc., could be included in, in the CF1 protection on page 86, perhaps specifically, um, because I didn't see anything regarding pews in there. Um, the parking is most important. What I'm concerned about, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not looking at the civil matter relating to getting agreement to park on someone's land. What I'm looking at, if this goes ahead now, as is, with no parking provision enabled, then we're going to get traffic parking up around that small bend in Brampton Abbots, in front of the houses, etc. There must be something that maybe defers or Grampian that makes it clear that there must be an agreement between the two parties so that no traffic will clutter up the, the uh, highway because it, the, the local roads won't, won't cope with it. Um, and again, with the number of I, I, I take on board what Councillor Milne said about the numbers of worship days. I think it's important if something can be arranged with regard to that, but I know that's not a planning matter. But I think overall, this matter is broadly supported. The areas which I've, I've concern is, is, is really the parking, because one group are saying they've got agreement, the other agreement, the owners are saying, no, you haven't. But if we can make that sure that the 14 car parking spaces that are available are able to be into reality, then I think that the community will be largely happier. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Durkin. Um, is it possible to condition that no um, works should commence on, on, on this until the car parking agreement has been reached between the two parties? Mr. Withers? Uh, yes, sorry, I was just putting my hand up to uh, to, to come in there. Yes, I, I, I believe that we can, um, uh, you know, word a condition that requires that. I mean, we're, we're clearly, as, a, as an authority, we're not going to get involved in the negotiations around that, but it would be for the applicant to provide us with the certainty um, of that agreement before, before we could discharge a condition regarding the parking, yes. So with that, um, I have, the proposal is from the chair, uh, seconded by Councillor Bowen, that uh, this application be approved with those conditions. May I remind members of the, the, the committee that you can only vote on an application before the committee if you have been present for the whole of the presentation and discussion 
the application. Does anybody wish to advise me that they are not permitted to vote? Take that as a nil return. Therefore, I will ask the legal advisor to ask each committee member in turn to state how they wish to vote. Ms. Evans. Thank you, Chair. So the mo members, the motion you have before you is that planning permission be granted subject to the conditions set out in the report, an updated report, and the further conditions regarding the noise attenuation measures and also the um, car parking. Um, if, if everybody's acceptable with that, I will now read through the list. If you can confirm whether you are for, against, or abstain from the motion. Thank you. Councillor Andrews. You're muted. Four. Four. Councillor Tillett. Four. Councillor Fagan. Four. Councillor Foxton. Four. Councillor Stone. Four. Councillor Bowen. Four. Councillor Hunt. Four. Councillor Johnson. He has left us. Thank as you. We said we have yeah, to. Councillor Milmore. Four. Councillor Milne. Abstain. Uh, Councillor Selden. Four. Councillor Watson. Four. The motion has been carried, thank you. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the business of today. Um, oh, Mr Withers. Just, just on a, a point of procedure, we've got a listed building consent application that goes with this, so there'll need to be a vote on that too. I assume, I assume there'll be a similar outcome, but um, we've only covered the planning application, I believe. Does, is it? Okay, sure, I, I will propose that with the um, with the same conditions. Do I have a and seconder? I, I will yeah, second that. I think Councillor Andrews just beat you to it, Councillor Bowen. Oh, dear. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. Ch Ch so, Chairman, Chairman yeah. Craig, your indulgence, please. With regards to the listed uh, building, uh, the, the matters of the Carew pews, etc., which are not in the protection part of the report, is it appropriate they be put in that part of the report? Thank you. Advice, please, Mr Withers. Um, I'm, I probably need some clarification on 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 the the point that Councillor Durkin is making there, because I, I think we're all understanding that the the pews are not being retained; they are being reused within other elements of the uh, alterations, the the mezzanine floor and, and other other panelling aspects. Yeah, I think Chairman, sure, sure, that that is the problem, Chairman. We don't know. Um, both the historic officer, our historic buildings officer, and Victorian Society have put concerns about them and a value judgment has been made and I understand where Councillor uh, Mr Withers is coming from but I'm, I'm asking the question should there be some protection for these pews? Well I, well I think other than securing perhaps further details as to how they are exactly going to be reused within the building um, I don't think I can I can say much more. I think we've we've had we've had discussions about the potential to retain some, um, and and the applicant has has asked us, or effectively confirmed that they want us to determine the application in its current form. So that is that is what's before the committee today. May I suggest then that we pr I propose from the chair that this uh, this application this is building applications be approved subject to the ward member being consulted over the use of the internal fixtures of the building. Is that seconded? I will second that. Thank you. Well, oh, yes, Councillor Bowen. Sorry, Councillor Andrews, you just missed out on that one. Um, with that, uh, members, it would be acceptable to you. I will ask uh, Mrs Evans to read out the name of the vote on the listed building's consent, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just referring, reiterating, this is for listed building consent um, uh, uh, with, with the obviously uh, additional point of um, listed building consent being, being approved subject to the ward member being involved with the details to do with the internal fabric of the building. Um, okay, so 
from the beginning. For, against or abstain, Councillor Andrews. For. Councillor Tillett. For. Councillor Fagan. For. Councillor Foxton. For. Councillor Stone. For. Councillor Bowen. For. Councillor Hunt. For. Councillor Milmore. For. Councillor Milne. Abstain. Councillor Seldon. For. Councillor Watson. For. That motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you for your tolerance um, with the technical issues this morning. May I now ask for the live stream to be stopped? <laughs>